This episode of the Inside Running Podcast is brought to you by Pillar Performance, Australia's leading sports micronutrition brand, providing high-strength, informed, sports-certified formulations to support recovery, boost immunity, and relieve joint inflammation for endurance athletes. Welcome to episode number 253 of the Inside Running Podcast. Thank you for joining us for another week. Big show coming at you this week. We've got some uh, fast times to talk about at the Luzanne Diamond League meet that happened last week. New South Wales and Victoria both had their half marathon championships. Moose will go on the loose. We've got another uh, Melbourne Marathon segment to talk about. More specifically talking about the course this week, which should be good. I think all three of us have ran events at Melbourne. All three of us ran the marathon at Melbourne, actually. And uh, to finish off the show, an interview with Hugh Van Kylenberg. So a lot of uh, stuff to listen to this week. Very grateful that you're giving us your attention. Thanks to the Patreon supporters who keep the show alive for its 253rd edition. And welcome to my co-host up in Canberra, Bradley Croker. How are you going this week? Uh, a bit crook, Brady, actually. Um, yeah, so... We got over hand, foot, and mouth, mouth in this household, and then uh, the next day, Lily developed a cough, and then Collis the next day, then Viv, and then me. So, pretty much since Thursday, I've had a cough, which um, yeah, is now I've got like a sore throat because of all the coughing I've been doing. So, there hasn't been a lot of running done in the last week. So, uh, yeah, it's been the, I reckon it's been my worst year for sickness ever that I can ever remember, starting with COVID in January. Nearly didn't recognise the voice when I uh, called it this this week. Wasn't sure if I dialed the wrong number, but uh, yeah, you sound a bit different than normal. Mm, sorry about that. I reckon it's better, actually, <laughs> to be honest. Anyway, my other co-host is Dan in Anglesey. He represented Australia at the 2019 World Championships at Doha. Julian Spence, how you going? Going better than Brad, that's for sure. <laughs> actually, uh, feeling pretty good. Haven't been sick this week. <laughs> so yeah, I'm all right. I'm up and about. Your turn next week. Yeah, yeah, it was last something. week. It's got to be yeah. my turn coming soon, I reckon. I've been going okay with sicknesses. Yeah, it's because you don't look after your kids ever. Hey, I'll do heaps of parenting <laughs> at this end. You're out running 190k <laughs> a week, yeah. off to work, down to Melbourne, to the footy, to races. I spend three days a week teaching children as well. I have more children interactions in my life than hey. you two put together. Anyway, I teach I teach children. High school kids. They don't come anywhere near you, though, do they? High school kids, <laughs> sit at your desk, stay away from me. Mm. Anyway, let's talk about some running boys. Moose, I'm going to go to you first this week. Tell us about your running week. Made the decision to pull out of Burnley Half Marathon last week off the sickness. So what did you do instead? Uh, sickness slash knee. So I ran, um, I actually had, or was I sick? Yeah, I had the gastro, actually. I can't. There's so much, <laughs> so many sicknesses that I forgot what it was. But yeah, last week I actually had had that gastro thing. So yeah, didn't run Monday, didn't run Tuesday. By Tuesday midday, I was feeling heaps better. So I ran 40 minutes around Anglesey, and then um, next day decided to do a little workout. Got some new shoes. Got our Saucony Endorphin Pro Three. I really wanted to try them out, so I thought I'd do a light workout. And I did, uh, what did I do, like 10 by, no, 20 by 30 second on, 30 second off. So pretty much just sur- like surges with 30 second jog in between. 
and it, it wasn't a very difficult workout. I know it, it actually sounds really easy, but it, it, it is pretty easy. Uh, the 30 second, I don't get fast enough where it puts me in like any sort of lactic deficit or anything like that. And then I was jogging real slow in the mean, in the, in the offs. So the heart rate stayed well under control. Uh, so it was 20 minutes of workout. I mean, I only averaged three fifty twos, but really enjoyed the shoes, which was good. Um, you guys may have had the other ones. I think we sorted you out with a pair at the very beginning, V ones. Mm-hmm. Any yeah. differences? Yeah, lots of difference. Okay, because it wasn't lots, a bad shoe, yeah. the version one. This one's um, this one's more like a super shoe. So it's just it's got more foam up front. It's got. Well, for me, it's it's it feels like I can wear it longer. I actually really like the fit of it. Uh, I know that it won't. The other one was a little bit shorter distance type shoe for me. I reckon I can go a bit longer in this. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was nice to get a little faster workout in. Half an hour the next day around town, jogged on the trails, uh, and then ran. Actually, ran with Ali the next day. Ran ten k down in Aries um, before. I went to work, and then Sunday morning drove to Aries again, ran with Jordan, a uh, f- friend of mine, footy guy, coach Anglesey at the footy this year, and we ran 15K. Um, this was a long run for me, really. I don't really go past an hour on easy days at the moment. Um, but this was in Aries, so a few hills. Felt, felt aerobically really good. Did have a bit of knee soreness which has been kind of lingering for a while now um so yeah that was my week i think i two days off did about 50 something k maybe only 51 k uh but that was gastro that's gastro for you hey um you don't seem to name many of your rate your runs these days on strava you used to be good with the old titles yeah not too much busy. happening too busy to put a strava title too- in yeah, well, yeah. I don't sit down. And, I, I got Come nothing. On, mate. You got four thousand nine hundred followers. Give the people what they want. A bit of entertainment when they're photos. scrolling through. I'll give some photos soon. He's not in a position to flex on Strava, so he just leaves it blank. Yeah, morning run, morning run. Yeah. Every <laughs> every uh, run last week was just morning run. Tell you what, I like though the comment, the liking of the comments. Oh yeah, in, it's great in isn't Strava because it? you know I'm a really funny guy and. When I make funny comments, people can like them now. So big ego boost. It is good, isn't it? Yeah. You, you, they should bring in a dislike one as well. I reckon. That would be oh, good. Oh, vote down. Vote, vote down. down. Vote up. Yeah. Vote down. Uh, that won't work for me. Especially for big dogs, who get a lot of comments. You know what mm. I mean? Like if I'm reading, looking at a Ben Park Strava, and he's got 400 comments on there, and I just want to see the like the highest voted, highest liked comment at the top there without clicking on it. What about uh, if you can vote down runs? So, like, say there's a run that goes up and you disagree with it or you think it was shit, you can give it an anti-kudos and, and, it, balance, and it might balance out the kudos. So a bloke might finish a run or a, or a girl might finish a run and uh, have a negative 10 kudos <laughs> by the time they get out of the shower because it was so bad. Social media at its best right there. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't see who's giving it to you. <laughs> oh, anonymous even better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. perfect. That's not a bad idea. I like that. <laughs> All right, that's your goal for this week. Yeah. Get a bit more creative with your uh, captions, okay, comments, gotcha. please, or some photos or something. Bradley, tell us about your kind of half week before you got sick. Yeah, so Monday, um, like it was a planned down week. I got home from work and... Um, I think I'd had a pretty shit day at work and it was pissing down rain and I figured it was a down week. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to take the day off because um, I think I'd strung together 24 consecutive days since my previous sickness. And um, sometimes I like actually just taking a day off as opposed to getting attached to a streak because I reckon sometimes when a streak becomes too long, you then go out the door for the wrong reason. So um, I decided not to run Monday and then Tuesday – uh, I did a, a treadmill session. Um, it was pretty easy, actually. I did a five-minute, four-minute, three-minute, two-minute, one-minute, five-minute uh, with 75 seconds um, recovery at four-minute Ks between each rep. So I didn't didn't jump off the treadmill for this one. It was just continuous. 
Uh, I didn't want it to be too intense, so I started the reps at um, 17K an hour for the five-minute rep, which is 330s, and then for each rep, um, I just increased the pace by half a kilometre, which is about five seconds a K. So I went like 330s, 325s for the four-minute, 320s for the three-minute, 315s for the two, and about 310s for the one-minute. Uh, and then for the second five minute rep, I went uh, 325s for that. So um, average around 330s for like seven and a half K. Heart rate, you know, probably only got, I think my max was like 162 or something. Wow. Average like mid to high 150. So that felt pretty comfortable. Uh, and then Wednesday, uh, I did 90 minutes instead of my normal two hours because, uh, yeah, it was a down week. So 413s. Um, I, I, my knee did start to get a bit niggly. So probably for the previous week, I was finding that any run that I was doing continuously for over an hour, it would start to get a little bit niggly after an hour. Um, but if I stopped and stretched my quad, I then didn't notice it. And like the pain, like it wasn't even pain. It was more just an awareness, like a tightness. Um, but this Wednesday was definitely the worst it had been in the week. Um, because like doing that session on the Tuesday, like if I do a warm up for 20 minutes, stop, do my session, stop, change shoes, do my cool down. Like I didn't even notice my knee at all on the Tuesday. It's just when I do, you know, continuous runs. Um, but then that was pretty much almost the end of my week for running. Cause I got sick then on the Thursday. Um, so I took Thursday off, Friday off, Saturday off. And then, um, like I didn't feel real sick with it other than just having this cough. Actually, today's probably the sickest I've felt. And um, so I went out yesterday. Uh, I just did 45 minutes. Um, my knee was okay. Like I didn't really notice it at all. Um, but I definitely noticed just um, my breathing being a bit restricted. So 420s for 45 minutes. Um, so that was my week, 48K. So, and it oh. sounds, sounds like this week's not going to be that flash either. <clears throat> Yeah, so nah, you can't do anything. You can't push through something like that, though. No, nah, like I, like I, I can't remember who it was that told me this, but years ago, it's like, like I don't have an issue generally running through a cold, but as soon as it goes into my chest, I just don't bother because, um, you know, it's hard enough running, but then if you've got shit going on with your chest, uh, you don't want to be sort of forcing that. So, um, yes, yeah, so I didn't run today and probably won't be running tomorrow um and probably won't even do a session at all this week i'll probably just jog at some point doesn't affect um the longer or the short to long-term plan though does it really it's plenty of time uh, for fukuoka potentially if that's where you're heading yeah well that's the thing i don't really have a plan so there's no point forcing it and you know the few days off will hopefully um get my knee to settle um because that was like, i'm yeah, probably more concerned tough. about the yeah. knee um which look, I don't think it's anything major because, as I said, like I can do a, I can do a session and not feel my knee at all. Um, like even yesterday, you know, like there may be a bit of awareness at the end of the run, but as soon as I, as soon as I stop running, there's no pain at all. I could get out, I could then go and do strides and not have any knee pain. So I was going to go and see the physio this week anyway. Um, uh, but I'm hoping that just having some time off, um, you know, it'll settle anyway. Yeah, hopefully. What do you, do you reckon, ITB? Oh no, no, it's definitely not ITB. It's more um, sort of more knee, like kneecap, if not sort of more medial, medial sort of kneecap. Um, it's more just a tightness than anything. It's not really that painful. But sounds I definitely like want to sounds like pat- it. patellofemoral stuff. Like even the um, like similar to what I've got really, but just a way less exa- way less um, severe. But yeah, the tightness of the quad maybe. Mal tra- like affecting the the tracking of the patella. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I'd just go and see the physio, maybe get back into some exercises that I haven't done for a long time. And um, yeah, but I'm not not too concerned at this stage. Like I said, there's nothing there's nothing in the short term to train for. So I just got to get myself healthy. Get it healthy. Get it right. Go again. I'll tell you about my week, fellas. It's a big one. Monday kicked it off uh, on the morning, sixty minutes at four forty seven pace. Then I got out for thirty minutes after work at four thirties. Um, Tuesday did Moose Fartlek. It's a good Fartlek this one, Moose. I'll give you credit for that. It's a very good uh, workout. Did five of them? Yeah, five of them. Um, We don't do the minute at the end, so we stop at 29 minutes. I just don't think there's much point, you know. I think people get caught up with how far can you cover in the 30 minutes, and then they (laughs) they end up keeping it steady for that last one minute. People like you. Hey, I, I don't do it. I cut it at 29. 
So you, um, mate, you made a campaign around seeing who could go the furthest. True, in this, but I did. Like all of last year, nine point five k in thirty minutes, guys. If anyone can beat that, I'll give you a free Patreon subscription. <laughs> I think that's what I said last year. But anyway, so yeah, three minutes. If you haven't done it before, three minutes, kind of a steady one minute jog, one minute hard, one minute jog, times five. That's uh, yeah. 30 minutes if you do it all that way. We were kind of hovering around 3.05s for the uh, three minutes and around three minute pace for the one minute. Got rolling in the one minutes towards the end. Archie dropped me. Don't know how he's got so fit so quick, that bloke, but um, he's looking good. So, yeah, a bit of that young man speed. Uh, 25 minutes only in the afternoon at 4.18. Got caught in a bit of a storm and I had my phone on me. And um, yeah, I just I, I was getting pretty wet and I just wanted to leg it home. So I ran the last K in 3.32, just trying to get out of this weather and trying to protect my phone. And it was going to be 30 minutes, but I just thought, nah, I'm just going for 25. Uh, Wednesday, got out before work at 6 a.m. and did two hours. Uh, average 4.09s, which I was a bit surprised with when I finished because um, I felt tired and I'm like, oh, this is definitely like a 4.20, 4.25 kind of day. And it wasn't until I got home in the driveway and saved the, because I just had the stopwatch face going, like saved the run and saw that it was 4.09. So I was uh, quite surprised actually. So yeah, it's a long day at work after doing two hours in the morning, but I don't mind getting it done. Um, I wanted to do it Wednesday instead of Thursday when I was at home with the kids because it um, gave me an extra day of recovery before the race. So Thursday then was 16K in the morning at 4.32s, and 8K in the afternoon at 4.33s. 15K on Friday morning, we um, just did like 8 30-second surges out the front of home, which was okay. Jogged like a minute in between those, I think it was. And then, um, yeah, 30 minutes in the afternoon. And then Saturday, I did 40 minutes early before I was going to go to Melbourne um, because the race was 8 a.m. start which is a bit too early for us leaving from you know three hours away so um, I was planning to go to Melbourne on uh, Saturday night so I dropped Hudson in Bendigo and then I checked my Instagram when I um, dropped Hudson in at Bendigo just before I got in the car again and had a DM from a guy called Mitch Wilson, boys. Can you remember we thanked Mitch on the show probably, oh, I'm going to say maybe six or seven weeks ago. Mm-hmm. He was the guy that was traveling overseas with Lyndon Hall and Cat Bissett. Yeah, yeah. Mitch. And we're, yeah, we're organizing some stuff with Mitch. Um, can't talk too much about it yet. But uh, I've never met him before, but a lot of DMs and stuff over the years trying to... um. Yeah, get a few things off the ground, which we'll talk about in coming weeks, hopefully, when some things eventuate. And I know he's a diehard Collingwood supporter, and he knows I'm a diehard Collingwood supporter, so we often talk about footy. And he'd said to me, um, this is like 1 p.m., I reckon, on Saturday. He's like, hey, my friend's just pulled out of uh, going to the footy today. I've got a spare ticket if you want it. It's all yours. So I was like, mate, this is this is a good deal. Is it still available? Because he'd sent the message a couple of hours before. And he's like, yep, all good. So I kind of pretty much then, yeah, drove from Bendigo to to Melbourne. I just put the MCG into my GPS because I wasn't sure where I was going to be able to park because there was like 90,000 people going to this footy game. And when the GPS pretty much told me that the MCG was 3K away, I just um, found a park and then put some uh, new balances on because I had some new balances in the back of my car. So I'm in in jeans, a hoodie and some new balances and then just ran 3K to the G, average 409s too, just got there when the first bounce was happening, and then got to watch a fantastic game of footy, Collingwood versus Geelong, 91,000 people there, capped one by one goal, so it was super close, and um, yeah, live sport is just amazing, so super grateful that um, yeah, Mitch hooked me up with a ticket there, had a couple of beers, could have easily settled in for a few more than we actually had, but um, yeah, great afternoon of entertainment there. And then Sunday morning was the Burnley Did half drive marathon. Home? Just drove home. Drove home afterwards. Oh, where did you stay? I stayed in Melbourne. I had accommodation booked in Melbourne. Ah. Uh, so yeah. So um. But I was kind of like northern suburbs because I was just thinking, oh yeah, I don't mind driving 20, 25 minutes in the morning, and that was my side of town anyway. So I drove back out to there afterwards. Um. And Twilight Game wasn't bad because I think it finished at seven, so I was kind of back at the entertainment at oh, sorry the accommodation at um. Yeah, 8, 8.30, so I could still get a decent night's sleep. And then the Burnley Half Marathon was on Sunday morning. This was round nine of the Athletics Victoria season. Um, such a strange race, this one. Moose, you'll probably know, like over the years, a lot of people use this one 
Um, a few people race it. More people do workouts. Um, mm. And it's an interesting one where I think we did eight U-turns. So they closed probably 3K worth of road, but you kind of go up and back a lot of times. Um, do you know what the actual main loop is? You know the loop you do three times? Is oh, that, how big the loop is. Is that maybe 6K? Yeah, I don't know. And then it probably I think would be you do a you little, do half. yeah, and then you yeah. do a little loop at the start. So, yeah, um, so yeah, we had all the same guys. I feel like I just say the same names every time I do an AV race. So the gun goes, Reese Edwards goes to the front. I'm sitting in there. Toby Mende sitting in there. Um, Abiri Belay sitting in there. And we kind of, I think, we're like a three ten with a U turn the first K, and then Reese got things rolling a bit, and we kind of sat as his pack of four to about. I'm going to say maybe like six, maybe five and a half, six K. Um, and I'm thinking, cool, this is the pack. This is where the medals are going to come from today. I was really keen to try and get a medal because um, I was fourth at Ballarat and I thought the half marathon would suit me suit me a bit better. And I was hoping that Andre, who won at Ballarat, wasn't going to rock up. Well, he did rock up in the end, but he was just doing a workout. So I'm like, beautiful, should be right, hopefully for a medal here. And then at 6K, Abiri Belay, um, we've spoken about him before. He's a guy from Ethiopia originally. 2.9 guy, isn't he, I think? Something like that. We'll say that. Sounds good that I'm racing a 2.09 guy. He went to the front, just put in like a massive surge, dropped Toby and I, and then um, Reese went with him. And they got like probably 20 seconds up the road. And Toby kind of joked to me, it's like, who makes a move like that at 6K into a half marathon? So then... Um, we watched those two boys go off into the distance, and then Toby and I kind of settled together in third and fourth, and then we uh, ran together until 10K, and we went through in about 31.10, so kind of like right on, what's that, like 66 low pace, um, and then I kind of said to Toby, I'm like, oh, pace feels like we should be going quicker than that, like that felt that felt hard for a 31.10. And then he kind of looked up, and at this stage, Reese had been dropped by a beery, and he kind of said, "Hey, I reckon we can catch Reese. Like he's he's not getting away from us. He's kind of running the same pace." And then about a k later, um, Toby just surges, and like we we're probably running like three hundred five, three hundred six. And he where just, is this on the course? This is like going through the finish line bit. So we just we'd done yeah. the little lap to start off with, and then we'd done one six k lap. So we're probably at 9K, so we've got like two of the 6K laps to go. I know that doesn't add up exactly to 21K, but the lap must be just under 6K. So he has just put in this massive surge, and I'm just like, okay, cool. Like, you, that is an amazing move to put in at the, you know, 10 and a half, 11K mark of a uh, half marathon. I just watch him in the distance. He goes up, he picks up Reese, he, um, the race tries to hang on to him for a few K and then he drops race. And then I didn't see him again until probably the 15 K turnaround and he's hit the front. And I'm like, I yelled at him. Cause when you go to the out and backs, I'm like, Toby, you're going to win this. Like, go man. This is an amazing run you're having. And then, cause he, it, at this stage he would have put in, he would have put 40 seconds into me from 10 K to, to 15 K. And I'm like, this guy's a machine. Um, and at this stage, I'm like, I'm solo. I've been solo since like, you know, 10 and a half K. And I'm just like, okay, just got to, just got to keep this together here. There was a bit of a pack behind me at the turn at about 12 K. I saw that like Seth O'Donnell, I think I clocked, he was about 30 seconds behind me. And then Liam Adams and Tom Thorpe were probably about 45 seconds behind me. So I'm kind of like, um, I'm kind of safe for fourth. So then after the turnaround at 15K, so Toby's hit the front, a beer is trying to hang on to him. Reese Edwards probably like 20 seconds back. I'm another 20 seconds back from there. Um, and then I take the corner and then I look to see where, you know, Seth, Liam and um, Tom Thorpe are. And Seth is literally like taking the corner with me. So then I'm hmm. like, holy shit. I'm like, and at this stage, I'm like, I'm having a bad day. Like Toby's put 40 seconds into me in 5K. Seth's caught up to me like 30 seconds in like two or three K. I'm like, I must be having a shocker. The season's too long. I must be running like 3.30 pace. I couldn't work out what was happening. The only consistent thing that was happening that was Reese Edwards was still the same distance in front of me. And we're lapping people and you're going in between people and it's just like, just chaos. So then I kind of split my watch at 15K and I'm like, well, I know there's 6K to go. It's going to take me 
19 minutes, just knuckle down and just finish this race off and try not to lose any more positions. And then we go to the out and back again at the, the north end of the course. I think it's north, whatever that direction is. Um, and all of a sudden, Seth's then caught Toby and Abiri, and he's winning the race. So it's just this rare, like, um, yeah, very rare race that, you know, three or four guys had a go at leading, people putting in different surges. I was just going through, like, weird head spaces where I thought I was running strong, but guys were flying past me, and then I was in the hurt locker. Um, I held on to fifth all good and ran 65.56, which I was, I was pretty happy with. Like, it's my second fastest half, and that course is, we've eight U-turns. I think it's probably on par with what I ran at um, Gold Coast, you know, that 65.27. So, um, and especially it was good for me to spend a lot of time. So I spent the last 11K pretty much by myself, and that's where you've just got to, you know, get into your own rhythm. And I think that's good practice for the marathon when you when you do get dropped or you find yourself between packs and you just got to settle into your own pace. So um, a very random race. Um, Seth O'Donnell did break 65. We'll get to those results later. Toby hung on for second. And um, yeah. So you didn't, you didn't say what Toby had miscounted. Oh, yeah, yeah. So then we finish and I'm just like, Toby, great run, mate. And he's like, yeah, when we went through 11K, well, he obviously didn't know it was 11K, which I'm not sure why, because at 10K, we had a conversation about our 10K split. He thought there was one lap to go, and he thought he could obviously win the race. So he ran some crazy... I did send them through to you boys yesterday. I think he ran like a, a 255 and a 252, probably thinking there was, you know, 5K to go when there was really 10K to go for him, which then probably played in the set's favour, because I think then when Toby got to the front and realised... It, there was still another five or six k to go, another lap. He um, put the brakes on a bit, which then Seth caught them. So, so yeah, he dropped me. He went. Well, we ran a three oh seven and a three oh nine for the ninth and tenth k, and then he went three oh two, three oh one, two fifty seven, two fifty four, three oh one, two fifty one, oh. thinking he was finishing. And then he's like, "Oh, I've still got another five k to go," and then ran three twelve, three oh eight, two fifty five, three oh seven, two fifty five. So he's still, he's still punched out. Some, and then you can probably see where the U-turns are too, like the 312. Oh, no, that didn't have a U-turn. That's when he went through the finish line. And oh, the out. U-turns are the fast ones because of the dodgy GPS. Not with the Coros, though. I reckon the Coros gets them pretty right. So he ran, on his watch, he's got 21.43 here. And I ran same course following him the whole way. And I was, um, what was I? I reckon I was 21. Uh, yeah, I was twenty one, twenty two. So he got two hundred meters extra than me. But I'm calling um, I'm calling it a long year anyway, Moose. I reckon it was uh Oh mate. Don't even don't <laughs> even. So you was, know what there are? There's two courses out there. There's one, there's certified courses and then there's short courses. <laughs> there's only two types of courses out there. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this one isn't certified, so um it was good fun. It was uh yeah, good to be top five, but yeah, it's a bit I don't know, you say it's a bit weaker, but there's still you look at the top 10, and I know some of the guys weren't having a crack, but there's still some good names there. So, um, yeah, good run. it was a good way, to, well. good way to finish the season. So, um, yeah. So what was do good. you think Seth, Seth has met, like, last 5K was? Oh, it must have been. Well, I think even more. Like he's, I think he was at least a minute behind us at one stage. That's what, like, has he run 29 minutes for 10K? No, I don't think so. Because I think we've probably, maybe those boys at the front have ran 30 30, 30, 20. I reckon he's probably ran 29, 20-ish for the last 10K. Yeah. Wow. Didn't wear a watch, so he's got no splits. But, yeah, it was super impressive. Um, and he just went... Because when he passed me, I'm like, okay, this like I'll just sit on him for... you know If I can sit on him for a K, this be good. So I just tried to... I said to him, good work, Seth. And then um, just tried to like... You know who you were? I don't know, hopefully. Hopefully he recognises the voice from the, the person that interviewed that. him a week ago. <laughs> Don't know. Um, probably, I don't think he had any idea who you were. Yeah, he's probably like he probably thought I was. He was lapping someone. <laughs> you know, when you're just lapping people, he's like, "Why is this guy?" Yeah, I went out good work. I sat behind him for about oh, I'm going to say six meters, and then I just got dropped straight away. So um, yeah, good day out, good weather, beautiful weather, no wind or a bit of drizzle at times. But um, yeah, we'll talk about in depth the the top guys and girls a bit later on. But that was uh, 157k for the week, which was good. Drove back to Bendigo afterwards, had my uh, grandfather's 80th, and then finally got back to Moama last night. So a big weekend, but some good stuff going on. 
let's thank some Patreon supporters, fellas. Okay. You want to kick us off, Bradley? Sure. Uh, I've got Michael Evans this week. Uh, we think Michael is from Adelaide. Uh, PVs of 1857, 3933 for 10K. 92 for the half, which he did at the Chevron City to Surf, uh, which I believe that's over in um, Perth. And according to Strava, he might be coming back off a break. So um, thanks for your support, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Moose, who you got? Michael, I've got Benjamin Drenovac. So we'll call him Drenners, as he likes to be known. Um, Drenosevic. Also, some of the staff call him. He's a fourth-year physio student, retail assistant at the running company Geelong. Please don't tell me he's got a fucking LinkedIn profile. Yeah, he does. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That's how I got this from. And I'm uh, like, why am I researching this guy? He's employed by Moose. This is a man who does not need a LinkedIn profile. Um, yes, so Drenner's run a strong athlete, coached by Gunther, getting faster. Doesn't do a lot of long runs, probably his downfall. Often runs long runs Sunday afternoon because he's on the piss Saturday night. So not great for that. Also not great for um, for productivity at the running company on Sunday mornings. Used to work at the Fines for Hotel and Coles. So slightly worse pay now, but <laughs> better work environment. Um, 37.54 at Launceston 10K. So that was a good run down there. And 132 Melbourne Half Marathon. But yeah, big fan of the show, Drenners is. Um, he was previously employed at the running company Geelong when Bree and I arrived. And I think his first question to me when I walked in was, um, is Brady really that much of a loser? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or do you just make it out like that? He did and not say that. He did. Benjamin, you know I'm the coolest guy on this show, mate. Every much... How much do you think he is a loser? It's that <laughs> so, Moose, he's got your retail assistant at the running company Geelong. What different titles do they have there? Is everyone a retail assistant, or is well, he or is he selling himself a bit short? No, internally he's just the, he's a cleaner. So he he comes in, cleans shelves, um, cleans the windows out the front, pretends to tell people about physio stuff, but I doubt. I'm like pretty dubious on his actual knowledge. <laughs> um, no, Drenners is good. He loves running. I mean, you, if we talk about frothers, frother, this man's up there with in terms of froth. Loves shoes too. Very passionate. Buys too many that he doesn't need. Um, he's going to be one of them running physio nerds. You know, the, the combo. Mm. Most physios, very like Dane Verway types. Oh, yeah. You know, loves running, loves physio. Welcome to the, combina- the nerd combo. Well, Benjamin, I'm thankful for your Patreon support, but not your comments about me being a loser. But, um, uh, that's a lie. I made that up. Don't cancel your card. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. You've said some harsh things about croaks. That's it. That's all right. I've got thick skin. I've got thick skin, unlike Brady. See, I don't. I was, gonna fucking, I was about to have a go at him about his PB at Launceston. Like, mate, give me a call when you're eight minutes quicker. But anyway, Matt Adams, I'm thanking you. You uh, you ran 242 at Canberra Marathon, which is a pretty good run on that course, I reckon. 114 at the Gold Coast Half Marathon recently. So that's a good run as well. They're quick times. I reckon he can go much quicker over the marathon too if he's banging out a 74 half marathon. 16.30 for 5K at the Tiger 5K at Richmond there. He's a midday miler, reps the red singlets. Um, I was looking through his Strava and he had a screenshot of the Imperfects podcast, which I thought was cool because we got the, the host of the Imperfects podcast on the show this week. Pretty ripped kind of guy. He's repping that kind of um, Jimmy Hansen Kieran Perkins kind of look, fellas, which we're seeing a lot more in distance running these days, aren't we? I think it's good. I think we got like stereo. Why, Why is it good? You've got it as well, Moose, haven't you? I think it's good because we used to stereotype that you could only have one body size if you were a male distance runner. And now we're seeing some of these bigger fellas coming in and running some good times. It's not a one size fits all approach. Yeah, Diverse... Deke, is it a... there's always been bigger athletes, though. Deke, Deke's not small. That's the man I'm thinking of. <laughs> no, but to- these guys are like, these guys could look like they'd knock it out easy. Yeah, These guys are just, like, big across the shoulders and arms. Whereas Deke had the tree trunk thighs and stuff, didn't he? Was he a bit light on up top, Deke? I, I think he was. Matt's not, though. Matt's, Matt That's could big go right in the octagon, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Matt, 
Benjamin, Michael, thank you. Legends for your Patreon support. Thank you, all the legends over there on Patreon, for your support. Keep the show happening each and every week. Some good bonus content coming at the moment. Road to Berlin with Christian every Wednesday. Moose is hosting that this Wednesday night, so that will be good. The big fella's getting close to his marathon in Berlin. Caught up with Ali Pashley the other day for a Friends of the Show episode. Get the show early. Um, got a few more guests I'm going to hit for Friends of the Show coming up soon. What else? You get access to all the bonus stuff we've done over the years. So over like 120, I think, bonus episodes. So um, yeah, if you want to support us on Patreon, if you think this show gives you some value, we would greatly appreciate that. Anything else to say there, fellas, before we go to running news? Thanks, team. Thank you. Uh, you keep you keep Brady turning up every Monday. Oh, I tell you what, oh, it's another yeah. thing, especially when Game of Thrones is on at the moment too, fellas. I wouldn't mind watching that on a Monday night, but here I am. Let's uh, talk about Luzan Diamond League. I'm going to read this from Athletics Australia. After running his second fastest time in the 1500 last week, oh no, we're not, are we talking about Luzan? No, this happened no. somewhere else. Brussels. Oh, Brussels. I murdered that at the start of the show too, boys. Could have pulled yeah. me up then. Anyway, just clicked. What are we? 30 minutes in. After running his second fastest ever time in the 1500 metre last week in Luzan, Stuart McSwain proved that his comeback after a season of illness was no fluke with a sensational sub-13 minute time in the 5,000 metres. Stopping the clock at 12.56.5, McSwain set a new personal best over 12 and a half laps and now knocks on the door of Craig Mottram's 12.55.76 Australian record. The Tasmanian also puts himself in contention for the World Athletics Championships in Budapest, dipping below the global 13.07 standard needed to qualify. Despite the swift time, the Australian placed sixth. Um, Kenya's Jacob Crop set a new world lead time of 12.45.7, while second place Geta Grant Fisher from the USA set a new USA record of 12.46.9. There were another three national records that tumbled in the same race, which was arguably the race of the meet. So it was an 8.7 second PB for Stewie. He remains number two of all time because he was there already. His fastest time for six years, fastest Australian um, for 18 years, and just missed that Australian record by 0.74 of a second, moves to number 10 in the world for 2022. Huge boys when I woke up seeing this news. I think it was Friday morning, maybe Saturday oh, morning. Sat- Saturday, Saturday morning. morning, yeah. Yep. First thing I thought when I saw it, I'm like, why doesn't it have national record next to it? Because I was hmm. like, I thought it got it, but then I had to look up and they just missed it 0.7 of a second off. It's a good run. So good to see him back. Like, to watch it? That? Yeah, yep. So uh, thankfully it recorded this week. So I was trying to work out, because um, I guess the other guys broke away you know, probably with 2K to go. So Stewie was off the back and you're trying to like work out whether he's sort of in contention of, you know, breaking the Aussie record, knowing that these guys were on track for, you know, 12.45. Um, And yeah, like, but to think, you know, he's had a pretty rough season and he would add a few, like, oh, I'm sure he would have been down in the dumps at times throughout the year. Um, But you look what he's done the last couple of weeks. So it's it's a good fight back. Yeah, huge. Moose, any comments? I didn't watch it, but... He's getting it. I mean, they're timing it well for this Diamond League final. Um, it's been pretty cool to watch the progress, and uh, we've always talked about him breaking this record, haven't we? We probably lined this record up before any other records that he actually broke, mm. as thinking this would be mm-hmm. his his one. Um, and I mean, he doesn't have it yet, but that's a pretty pretty promising sign. Yeah, going under 30 minutes is a big deal. There was also that list that he, he actually shared the list on his own Instagram. It's like 10 athletes that mm. have broke, broken 7.30, 3.30 and... 13 um, minutes. 13, yeah. It was a who's who of, athlete, big, of big, athletics. Big yeah. names. Do you know Bikili wasn't on there? He's taken he hasn't down. done. He hasn't done this uh, sub three thirty. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool. There was another one as well, and I think there was only three names on the list of people who were broken. Was it three thirty and twenty seven thirty? You could probably make some things up like that. Yeah, that's his, talking about his range. We've always known he's got range, but I think it was him, Mo Farah. I don't know who the third one is, because yeah, you said Bikili hasn't run. 
done Katir, it. maybe? Mohamed Katir, he's, would he have done it for 10k? I don't think he's done it for 10k. I might look it up while we're talking. But yeah, phenomenal result. Um, and that Diamond League final is coming up this week. That's in um, Switzerland. Begins Thursday, 8th of September. Two-day meet, though. So I guess that'd be Friday, Saturday, our time. Croaks, mm. you want to tell us about the um, the women who raced over there, 1500? Yeah, so we had two girls in the 1500, uh, George Griffith and Jess Hull. Um, Georgia finished eighth in 402.96, which was her third fastest time ever. Um, and it also means that she's qualified for, or she's run the time to qualify for next year's World Championships. Uh, and Jess Hull finished 12th in 407.2, which, um, yeah, she had a tough day out. She was off the back relatively early. Um, but the race itself was won by Ireland's uh, Kiara McGeehan, um, who clocked 356.63, which broke Sonia O'Sullivan's um, national record. Mm. Pretty good run. Come from no, I actually didn't know her before this season. She had that good run in the um, 1500, didn't she? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty good. You wouldn't have caught that either, Moose, if you didn't catch the first one. No, uh, I didn't watch any athletics this week. You tell us about uh, Brett Robinson, because he was also in the meet, but didn't get to the finish line. Got at the start line, not the finish line. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I've been, I would listen to the, for the kudos, the, his podcast, um, and I, he was travelling over to Brussels to run a one hour race so one hour on the track um mm. he did compete in that race however he dnf'd um and three kenyans won uh the win winner ran 21.25 thousand meters <laughs> or 21.25 kilometers 21 I 21 kilometers and 250 meters yeah <laughs> Um, weird event, but yeah, no, it, I, it's strange because listening to the past few weeks, maybe months even, he's had a bad Achilles injury and these races, you're required to wear spikes because it's a track race and it's illegal not to. Um, so I, I mean, I was a bit perplexed by the decision to, to run that, um, leading into London marathon, given like, this is a pretty big marathon for Brett, obviously, he's had some go against him lately. I would have thought that they would be trying to do everything in their power to get him on the start line as healthy as possible. And I can't see how running an hour race on the track in spikes is with a with a suspect Achilles is a is a good decision. Like the only thing that I can think of is that it's just a, a financial. Um, it was like it was worth it financially to do that. Whether it was, it was a small his... field though, wasn't it? Like it didn't seem like much of an event, but maybe they're throwing money at it to get people there because there's not many people keen to do it. That that's what I was thinking. Also, it might have been a, a a bonus attached to the one hour record for Australia, like a world, like a national record might get bonuses in a contract. Oh, I, yeah, that's usually the case, isn't it? It it is, but um, like we're speculating. I just I like to me. So close, what are we, five weeks from London? Uh, four weeks? No, I think it was four weeks. It's it the same day as like Melbourne. Would four and a half, four, weeks, four, and and half like weeks, yeah. four weeks and two days. Four and a half, yeah. So, I mean, I I think there was, like, you can run a half marathon or something, like, but you, you're wearing protective shoes, you're on the road, not the track. Uh, it was... It was like 27 degrees, I think, on the day that he ran it. Um, he pulled out, which was a smart decision, I think. Six k in, he got. It, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure how the first six k went, but um, it just even just travelling to another country for this event like interrupts your training as well. So I just like to me, I'm like, oh, don't like the decision. Put the Ferrari in the shed, you reckon? Protect well, it. I'm a fan of Brett as a runner, and so like, this is like me. What like if I'm supporting my <laughs> football team, I'm like sitting back going, "Don't make that decision. Like, that's not good for the team." So is this the example, Moose, where he puts it up on Strava and you give the uh, anti kudos? Yeah, this is a this is an anti kudos. <laughs> um, I will read what he put there because I got it here. Unfortunately, a DNF. I have a bit of a sore Achilles before this race. I felt. 
going much further. I would have ended up with an injury and compromised my prep for London Marathon. Not injured, just playing it safe, plus it was 27 degrees and wouldn't have ran that fast. Yeah. Eight comments, 424 kudos. Um, yeah, so I know, like, it, I mean, it's for me, just being in spikes and Achilles is a danger. Like, I know the Dragonflies might be a little bit better, but it's still a spike. It's still on the track. And even if you ran a hard 10K on the track in spikes, that would be um, a pretty high stress for the Achilles. I know you run a bit slow about going twice the distance, um, which was what the plan was. Interesting. Yeah. His Ks the last two weeks have been 136 and then 148. Because he did yep. get, he did do two hours at three fifty four pace on that Sunday. Yeah, so he's. I mean, he pulled out of the event. So, hopefully, like his Achilles is still okay. Obviously, to be able to do that, but um, whether there was a workout that could have gone in there instead, like a safer. Or... Mm. Yeah, because you'd expect four weeks out, be higher mileage and that, and some a lot bigger long run. Mm. But anyway, watch his space. He's going to break the strain record. Yes or no? This far out? No. Okay, yeah, Croaks, yes or no? No. Okay. Hope he does, though. Hope he does. Uh, so that was that. We'll go to Victoria next, where the uh, Burnley Half Marathon was. So I've spoken about the men's race in a lot of detail. Seth O'Donnell, he won in 64.56. Toby Mende, 65.09. Abiri Belay, 65.18. In the women's race, Melissa Duncan made her debut. Uh, for half marathon, she ran 73.46. Rachel McGuinness, she ran 74.44. And Kate Mason ran 76.53 in the women's results there. So, uh, yeah, interesting to see Mel Duncan go up to the half marathon. I guess mm. she's got that cross-country background. She did make a um, couple of world cross-country teams, didn't she? Pretty sure. Croaks, you know a lot about Melissa Duncan. Uh, yeah, she's, like she's, she's strong. She won the 10k yeah. cross. Yeah, she's probably known more as a 1500 meter runner. I remember when she was living here in Canberra, we went up to um, Orange to do a fun run, and I think she entered the 10k because like it was decent prize money, and I think she did the race with like some music playing in her ears because it was like at that time like such a long event for her to just just to stay like focused. Um, but obviously that was you know what eight years ago, so bit older now and that's what distance runners do as they get older they just go longer they do so um yeah interesting to see where she goes on the roads the uh team's results though the men's geelong cats got their first win cats, of the season baby. only need five first five scorers at this one uh ladies and gents so uh 120 points for the cats melbourne uni 147 so they're their first podium for the year as well Box Hill Horses, who have been in our second place on the ladder all year, in third spot in the scoring, 166. The women's race, Glenn Huntley scored 39 from four finishes. South Melbourne, 44. So close race there. Box Hill in the women, 66 for third. Both the Premiers have been decided now, boys. The Bendigo Bats can't be caught in round 10. Declared Premiers and Glenn Huntley women. So um, that's the show's over for both the men and the women. But men's third up for grabs between Western Athletics and Geelong. I think Geelong's got a two or three point lead now. They're moved into third place. So yeah, we'll just have to sit on them at, at the tan. Sit on just them, cover, yeah. Cover their moves. Just, you, you know, don't you make. You see, they're flown Jack Rayner back, though. Yeah. So he well, must come back for the tans and then go back for London. Marathon. He's been, cr- he's been, quiet, he's been quiet on Strava, though, Jack. Yeah, I think he's gone off it, but they reckon he's in shape and he's going to run the first leg at 10 relays. Doesn't want their boys getting pipped off the podium. We got uh, Mark Fountain back. <laughs> got Lee Troop, Lee Troop back from Boulder. <laughs> he's going all right. Mottram. Yeah, has got, 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 got a bit of fire in the belly now that Sue is pretty close to his yeah. national record. Louis yeah. Rowan's coming back. <laughs> Don't worry about Geelong. We're all right. What do you think about the Bats news, Croaks? First time in history, the Bats got the win. You would have been pretty proud seeing that. Bit emotional. Felt uh, weird getting out of bed, actually, this morning, knowing that I'm a premiership runner for the Bats. Uh, no, I wasn't emotional, but congratulations. I know that you guys have uh, put a lot of work and effort into the season, so good to see you're rewarded. Good to see you are rewarded. It's hard, hard to, um, but, you know, next year now, it's going to, I don't know, like, it's probably not as special just defending it as it is winning it the first time. Oh, nowhere near it, yeah. I don't think I'll run next year. 
trying to stay at home and actually uh, do some stuff around the I house. You, instead you of going to sit, Melbourne every Saturday. You, you would just sit at home and look at your look at your tat. Cook down at the bat tat. Yeah, I got mm. one of the temp ones on Sunday just to just check position. I went a bit low though. I got to go a bit higher up. How far is your Chico State one down, Moose? That's just what I'm trying yeah, to just get too low. Like too low for the Chico State one. It's too low. If you wear nah, half tights, yeah, can you still high. see it? No, you can't. Okay. Still, still, I'm going back. I'm doing it again. It's going higher for sure. What, you're going back to get another Chico State one? No, no, if I'm going back in oh, time. Sorry, I thought you meant going time. back. <laughs> yeah, I'll get one on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Just a bit higher on the other side. That's good. Thanks to all the Bat fans out there writing comments and stuff on my Strava. Geez, you f- I feel a little shallow though, knowing that you didn't get there legitimately. We're going from Div- Division 5 in yeah, 2017. Yeah, we've been through Division 5. It. Remember all those Muppets that they were saying we didn't deserve to be there, we'll get kicked out straight away, relegated. No one said that. They 20 just points ahead with one round to go. There. So anyway, we'll celebrate. We've got the next two weeks. And then they're, they're th- talking about doing something special at Tan Realize where they bring back legends of the Bendigo um, Bendigo Bats to run in the Premier Division because we can come last in, in Premier Division. So, so you have zero legends. They're talking about bringing Croaks back, giving him a leg. Yeah. A couple of old timers back in the day, giving them a legs. You mean old people. Uh, just some legends. Not legends, old people. Legends of Bendigo Bats coming back. Have a legends around. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're ahead. Australia's premier micronutrition brand, Pillar Performance, is the leading choice when it comes to high strength formulations to power Australian running performance. Pillar's range is purposely formulated to support optimal recovery, elevate energy production, relieve joint inflammation, and boost immunity providing potent, targeted micronutrition support to middle and long distance runners. The Pillar range is now completely informed sports certified, meaning all Pillar products are independently batch tested and athlete safe. This commitment to quality and clean sport now sees Pillar used by more than 40 professional sporting teams and countless individual athletes across the country. The Pillar team is celebrating the recent launch of their Ultra Immune C Powder, an immunity-boosting formula featuring a high-strength dose of vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D. The perfect partner for a heavy training block or race preparation, Ultra Immune C, has been developed in consultation with leading professional sporting organizations to address the specific immunity challenges associated with run-down athletes. The powerful combination of immunity-boosting micros is delivered in a light powder and features a delicious tropical twist, keeping your immune system firing in even the toughest conditions. To celebrate this release, the Pillar team has an exclusive offer for Inside Running podcast listeners. Head to their website and use the code SKIPSICK to receive a $10 off Ultra Immune C. That's S-K-I-P-S-I-C-K. To redeem this offer, or for more information on Pillar Performance and their range of sports micronutrition, head to pillarperformance.shop. New South Wales, though, Croaks, they also had their half marathon champs up there around Olympic Park. Certified course this was, too. I like how they did this. We spoke about it a few weeks ago. Yeah, it was. So, Ed Goddard, um, yeah, showed everybody a clean pair of heels. He won in 63.26. Aiden Hobbs uh, had a bit of a sprint finish with Benny Saint. They both recorded 66 flat. Uh, and Leo Pedersen, um, he was fourth in the race, but the third New South Wales in 67-37. Uh, in the women's, Marnie Ponson got the win in 76-10. Rebecca Lowe second in 76-20. And Rosie Weber third in 76-44. Hear any, uh, any news about it? A lot of U-turns uh, in this one too. Yeah. They had like no, 15 U-turns or something, didn't they? Uh, I don't know how many U-turns, but yeah, I know they went onto the track. Like every lap, they did sort of half a lap around the track. Oh, and then, did they? He- yeah, then headed back out of the stadium, yeah. Okay. So, mm. um, but, very good. But no, I haven't heard, good haven't heard any Benny reports. back racing. Yeah. wonder if you'll have a crack at another marathon. Yeah. Be interesting. Mm. Moose takes to South Australia, fits his 5K. Athletics of South Australia put this on. Road race. 5K, winner, ladies, Jess Trengo, 15.27. In second place, one minute back, 16, uh, Tara Palm. Brooke Hines was third, 16.43. Riley Cox won the men's, 14.12, beat Max Stevens, um, ex-teammate, 14.20. 
with Jakob Cox, 1425, <laughs> current teammate. So good current, to see. Current brother. <laughs> current brother. Um, brother in law of Izzy. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a fast course over there. Some quick times. Yeah, it would be. Um, what does this unofficial mean after the 50s five? Uh, this was just what Adam Diddick put on Twitter. I think it was just his results he was getting when he was there. Uh, unofficial results. So fifteen twenty seven, good from Jess. That's quick. Mm. That's real quick. That's what I'm yeah, she won by a minute. The marathon. Yeah, I mean that's this. That's she ran with knitted, didn't she? Well, especially when she's not known for her like five k. Like yeah. you know, generally the the longer the better Jess goes. Um, she's always sort of struggled a little bit over that sort of five k distance, but. Um, yeah, she's finding a bit, bit of speed. Nah, but we said that about her over 10K until she won Launceston. Mm. Yeah, and, I mean, she's the she's the Commonwealth Games gold medalist in Eventually running. Pop in her step, you reckon? Yeah, yeah, she out there with a bit of swagger now. And hometown hero, back and on home earth. And remember somebody asked, uh, one of the questions was, like, how fast do you think she would have run or she could have run on a flat, fast course you know, when she ran um, what she did at Com Games, and we said, like, you know, 224 or something, which, you know, like, you should be running 1527 if you're running 224. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can do that at the time, but but then yeah. coming back afterwards. I mean, it's, it's been a little bit, but it hasn't been that long, has it? No. Just to yeah. confirm, she was five seconds behind Nitta. Don't want Nitta writing in saying that he, um, when I said she'd beaten him. Apparently passed, he passed her at 4K, maybe. Okay. But I'll be sitting on her whole time kicked away use that speed some more overseas results croaks this was big morgan mcdonald yeah um when i saw this result so he finished fourth in a 5k in italy ran 13 19 which um yeah like i thought he'd be actually stoked with but i listened to his podcast and he was actually quite disappointed because he um he actually committed pretty hard like i think they went through 3k in like seven low 750s which he normally goes a little bit more conservative and tries to kick home. And so um, he, he thinks he sort of bl- like blew up or struggled in that second half. So he thinks he's fitter than that, which, you know, possibly is. But, I, you know, I thought 13-19, like, you know, after all the injuries he's had since the Olympics was a, was a good comeback. Um, and Matt Ramsden was in the same race. Uh, he was 15th in 13-51. Yeah, it's good. People forget that Morgan was beating Ollie, like, before Ollie got good. Well, he was always good, but like Ollie was always like the apprentice for Morgan. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Well, like Morgan is the real deal. He's just been injured for a few years. Oh yeah, he's he's more than a real deal. He was um, uh, he was beating he was beating Grant he was beating Grant Fisher. Yeah. So yeah. He, Across country. You know, so he's on the same level as you know. Or we beat him at track as well at uh, NCAA. Um, mm. so you know. He'd be seeing what Grant Fisher's running, going, well, there's no reason I can't run that. You know, it was only a few years ago I was beating you. Mm. Watch this space. Could be your uh, 2022 pick of the year. Morgan McDonald. Uh, this next segment, boys, thanks to Melbourne Marathon. This segment is brought to you by the 2022 at Nike Melbourne Marathon Festival, returning Sunday, the 2nd of October. Run past the city's most loved landmarks and finish on the hallowed turf of the MCG. So you secure your spot at melbournemarathon.com.au. And from the team at Nike Melbourne Marathon, it's all selling pretty fast on all distances. They are at 90% capacity for the half marathon. So if you're looking to do the half, you better get your registration in pretty quick. Don't miss out. What we're talking about this week, though, fellas, is the courses. We've all ran Melbourne Marathon. Were you done the half there as well, Moose? Uh, I did the half as my first ever fun run, ever, 2007 or eight. Was it on this course or was it still like from Frankston to Melbourne? No, no, no. <laughs> I did no. that one as one of my first ones. Oh, did you? Yeah, I think no, I ran no, an hour 25. Not. You know, Frankston to Melbourne, that's the marathon. So how are you going to cut that in half? You just start half on the way. Like, oh, yeah, way. yeah. It used to finish out. I remember finish outside the um, the art center there. Jeez, oh, it, was yeah, long, yeah. it was a long day that day. Hour twenty five, I think I was out there for. Hey, that's when I. That was like the time that I started with. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Me and you were like Crokes has like got all that super like talent, but me and you had just been grinding out over the years. Yeah, Even no, I remember. That. I re- there was a girl f- who was the girl that ran for the Northern Territory. Oh, Back in no the day, idea. it was war. I'm going to look it up. Craft could be. 
I remember running with a small little blonde lady. Nah, Emma was pretty nah. tall. Oh yeah, she was. I remember running past her, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" There's like state runners here. What's going on? Why were they wearing this um, different uniform? Um, it what, was, year, what year was this? I reckon it was 2008. Oh, okay. I'm thinking 2009. No, 2009 maybe. 2008 it was. Um, yeah, it was bloody fun. I loved it. I thought it was the best thing ever. I thought like there's such good vibes. I got there with about three minutes to the start line, way at the back of the pack. Like I was running on the median strip on the other side of the road trying to get around everybody. I reckon I walked for the first 500 metres just because there was no room to run. Um, and then got going, went through Albert Park. Yeah, bloody, it's good. Loved it. That is, if you've never done an event before, it would be the perfect place to start because it's so well organised, obviously, and like shutting major roads and the landmarks, which I just spoke about at the start of this segment there. Um, yeah, it's not many races where you get to experience some of these landmarks that are on course. Let's talk about the uh, marathon course to start off with. A lot of our listeners will obviously be doing the marathon. Uh, we did get a question here about how do you break up this course into different segments? When you boys have raced it, have you ever mentally sat down and thought this is section one of the course, this is section two, anything like that mentally you've done beforehand? Mm, not really. I th- like I've only done the marathon once and it was the super windy year, so... And I guess for me, I, I my goal was to tick the two hour forty five to qu- like get the automatic qualifier for Berlin the following year. But g- given it was super windy, you sort of need to just take that into account a little bit, like knowing when to maybe push and when to conserve. Um, and I know we've spoken about it before, but I think you just need to hold back a little bit more, just because you like it is a like it's not not a super tough finish but even coming back up st kilda road it's a bit of a false flat and then you've got the bit up around and the shrine of remembrance so it's, you know it's not like gold coast where it's dead flat like the whole way so you probably want to hold, have a little bit left in reserve for that last 5k more so than you would for you know a dead flat course yeah and be prepared to be turning away from the finish line like mentally when you're coming down st kilda road and then you need to head up towards the shrine of remembrance like mm-hmm. Mentally, that's hard to be doing at that stage of the race because once you turn at Alwood, what would that be, Moose, 25K? Yeah, I think about that, 25. Yeah, so, so like you feel like you're on the going out and then you feel like you're coming back and then at a very tough part of the, the race mentally and physically because you do have that climb up towards the shrine, you then have to turn directions. So um, I find that's always challenging. I always like to think like, well, I don't know for me last year, it's like first part of the race, get to the lake. Okay, like just settle, relax early, get to the lake, and then it's like get out of the lake and get to the halfway part. And then I know my third section of the course last year was like get down to the turn at Elwood, and then it was like get back to St Kilda Road, get to the shrine, and then get home. So um, that's how I broke it up last year and thought that was that was enough without it being too many different sections in my head. Um, it's It's a great course for rhythm. Like there's a lot of straight lot lines and if you're in the right pack where you should be and you're feeling in control, you can really just switch off a bit and just really lock into a, a nice rhythm I've found. Uh, I know this year with the half marathon, the last couple of Ks is a bit different. Have you guys got the map open there? I just um, was looking yeah, at it today. It yeah. yeah. So it used to turn right and kind of go down the path in between Fed Square um, and it'd go over that. Is it Barramon Ma? Is that what it's called? Something like yeah. that over the bridge yep. there to the MCG. And it was a bit of a tough hill. I remember the year 2019, I came third. Aiden Hobbs and I were racing for third spot. And um, that was quite challenging come up over there. And then you had a really sharp turn when you came down off that hill. Whereas now they follow the same path as the marathon. So they're going to go straight down after you come out of the botanical gardens there um and of course the half marathon doesn't go all the way to the shrine so you don't have to go up that hill we we're just talking about you turn right back on the st kilda road and go all the way to fed square fed, uh, fed square flint street station and then follow the road back into the mcg so that last couple of k of the half marathon is going to be much quicker than it was in previous years so um mm. and now if it's a still day at melbourne there's no reason why that can't be a very fast course for half marathons 
Yeah. Well, the, even the marathon, like I said the other week, like look at um, the times that some of our top girls have run there. Like Sinead's run quick, Lisa Waitman's run quick, um, Jess ran a PB there. The, like I think she ran at 2:27, like which at the time was a PB. So, yeah, if weather's good, like you can run fast on any of these courses. Hmm. And hopefully it is. Like it's as I said, I was racing in Melbourne yesterday morning. And it was perfect weather for a marathon. So course it's something we can't control though so i wouldn't be looking into it too much but be be willing to change a plan if um you know if it is windy if it is wet be prepared with uh all your vests and things like that band-aids if it's going to be wet um, and that's the thing that people should be doing in training now i know a couple of my guys who i'm coaching and prepping for it like this last weekend has been that kind of dress rehearsal stuff like i want you getting up at the same time and having the same breakfast that you're going to have on marathon morning I want you practicing having the same gels as what you're going to have throughout the marathon. What are you doing with drinks? All those kind of things now. Same shoes, same socks, same kit. All that kind of stuff that you can do now um, to just not cause yourself stress in the last week. And this, you know, you're probably hitting some pretty big workouts about now, a month out. Um, So it's a perfect opportunity to practice all those things. Anything else you can think of there, fellas, before I go to a couple of um, listener questions? All those course maps are updated on their website as well. Make sure you go straight to the website, though. Don't just Google it and hit the top link, because I did that today, and it um, it still took me to the 2021 one, and there's been a few changes with that half marathon course. Oh, it's worth noting as well, because the marathon starts an hour before the half marathon, you can do some simple maths to try and figure out what time you're going to run for the marathon when you'll be running with the half marathons on potentially the same part of the course um i know last year when i did the marathon we caught some half, well the half marathon has actually caught us on st kilda road when i was probably at 30k and they were probably at 14 15k um so it's good to know that that they're going to be coming through or are you someone who's going to be in the half marathon and there's going to be marathons come marathoners coming past you as well so have a look at the start times there and mm. yeah be because you don't want to you don't want to shock on the day being oh i didn't expect to to be running past people or to have people running past me so all those little things that you can nail now yeah because i think like you know two hour half marathoners are going to finish with three hour marathoners so um like if you're you know in that sort of two hour half or probably hour 50 to two hour half marathon group like expect some three hour marathoners to be coming through so um you know it sort of works both ways like just try and you know keep left i suppose um because as you know like you know the back end of the marathon the last thing you want to be doing is like trying to dodge a lot of people so just be aware um yeah keep to the left if you're sort of not overtaking people just follow instructions from the officials but around that part of the course, be um, be aware that people might be asking you to do some a, stuff. There ain't officials there; it'd be volunteers, and a lot True. of them aren't. A lot of them aren't in the place to direct people like that. Yeah, yeah. I would. No, it's yeah. It's it's. You're right. Hopefully, it's you. T- you just sort of recognise that there's people coming past, so you stick to the left, and the marathoners they go to the right. I think it's, it's like, a big enough road there too. There was that hard year when there was roadworks and stuff through there, and it got a bit thin. But I yeah. think this year it's um it's all opened up again. Couple of questions here though, fellas. The listeners sent in geared towards Melbourne Marathon, Nike Melbourne Marathon Festival. First one, um, should I mix up the brand of gels I'm having? This I thought this was interesting because um you know people tend to just start on the same or stay with the same provider of gels if they pick a brand and stick with them. Ever jump between different brands during the race, boys? I I haven't done that during a, a race before. But the, the main reason people say not to do that is because if you get a stomach issue, you don't know which gel caused it. So it's it's mainly for training. If we have someone come through and, and they want to try different gels, we'll, we'll definitely encourage that, just not at the sa- on the same run. Um, we try to like stick to – if you're going to try Morton, because Morton are on course, like it, it makes the most sense to try that gel. Um and if everything goes well, stick to it. But if something doesn't go right with with a particular gel, then um, yeah, you'll know exactly wh- which gel it is or which brand it is because you haven't had anything else to um, confuse the matter. So yeah. if if you've worked out that the gels are doing like if you don't have any issues, you can certainly mix it up. Yeah, and just it's the stuff you've been practicing with again, though, isn't it? What we've spoken about, like what's sitting well in your stomach at the moment, three or four weeks out. 
that you're going to use on race day. Don't like book accommodation in Melbourne, travel down there, go to the running company in Yarraville or whatever and just um, pick up some random gels because they look good on the shelf for the race day the next morning. Yeah, get them early. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. You want to, that should like, be all the stuff like, people are ordering now, eh? It's like anything with the marathon. You want to try and restrict the amount of variables possible. So, you know, gels are one of those that, like, you know, you should have practised beforehand. So you don't want to be, yeah, trying the new ones on the on the day. There's, a, there's enough variables in a marathon, but that's something that you can control. Yeah, what about this one? This is coming from Court. He says, or she says, um, pros and cons for running with a pacer. It's going to be my first marathon, and I'm weighing up whether I go at solo or pacer. I guess mm. it depends on what pace they want to run at here, because if your goal is to break three hours and there's going to be a pacer at three hours, which means there's probably going to be you know, potentially 60, 70 people sometimes in those packs. Um, if you're going at it alone, you, you're not going to be running the pace you want to be running at because there's going to be such a big pack doing that pace. So you're going to be going quicker or slower. But I think sometimes with the paces as well, you've still got to keep an occasional eye on that they're going the correct pace. Mm. Like they're not, they're not Brad Croker paces here that are like getting a very good wage to make sure the Ks are very split on. They do a good job, don't get me wrong, but sometimes a few of them like to bank a few uh, a bit of time early and just give it a bit of buffer, which might not be the best thing for everyone in that pack. Yeah, they're, they're designed. I think they've been they're encouraged to 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 put together a little buffer. Be I'm not sure what it is. It's probably different for each distance. Um, but they are community runners generally. So if so, like I know one year they grabbed this bloke from Geelong triathlon guy, and they had him at the, you're going to be. They said you're going to be the no. I'm sorry. He put his hand up. Said I'm going to be the two hour forty five marathon pacer. The bloke's PB was two hours fifty eight or something, and and he cooked it like he fully fully cooked it. He couldn't do it. Um, so just recognise that like that can happen. Uh, and so if you're getting a feeling out there that something's not right, trust your gut. But it's a pretty good pretty good environment though. Like a lot of those paces, they are like very invested in getting you to your goal, mm. and will will help you as much as possible. And there's a good um, vibe around the pack too. Yeah. Everyone's got the same goal, so I wouldn't um, discourage it. That's for sure. And I mean, if you're going to be running slightly, look with a slight buffer, chances are like you're going to be running next to these people anyway. Yeah, exactly. One, one thing I'll say, like some of these packs get massive, and like sometimes I think it's better off maybe just being a little bit off the pack just so you're not having to chop your stride all the time like because it can get pretty like yes it's great having a lot of people around but if you're having to like constantly like chop your stride like you know dodge people and also when it comes to drink stations if you if you got like a pack of 50 or 60 and it comes to a drink station like you you almost want to get ahead of that pack you know before you get to the drink station just to give yourself some space or just drop back and then come through um because that that can be a bit of a shit fight yeah can you imagine that morton station if everyone's <laughs> yeah. like hey i've got my three mortons in my pocket but i'm banking on getting one at at one of those two stations and then the three hour pack goes through and yeah. 58 of the 60 blokes want to stop and get a gel and there's 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 not that many people lined up to give them to you um that could get messy so it's it's about that kind of thing like if you've got family or friends handing you drinks or gels on the course like that's when you get out of that pack or drop back from that pack 500 meters a kilometer before and just get a bit of your own rhythm so you can pick up that stuff and then maybe resettle back in the pack because rhythm's important in the marathon and yeah as Craig said you don't want people clipping your heels or or getting your, your your stride chopped i suppose so yeah good question there hopefully that helps and then a final one boys um it's gels as well. We get a lot of questions about gels, but how many gels would you recommend for a sub three hour marathon attempt and when to take them? Um, I'm going to recommend oh, sub three hours. So let's just say someone's going three hours on the dot, a bit easier. Um, yeah, I think I'm, that's what they mean, like just right on it. Yeah, six gels. Yeah. Two per hour. Say so there's 25 Five. grams of carbs, that's 50 an hour. That, and that and and that's just a base general recommendation. If you're a really small person, that might be too much. And if you're a really big person, you could probably do uh, nine gels. Um, and if you can tolerate more, do more. 
So this is like you can't get specific nutrition dietary advice like doing this, but um, we normally recommend or, well, I, I kind of use it as a general guideline in the store that two gels an hour for the majority of people out there is absolutely achievable. And if not, they, they should practice to do more than that. Yeah. yeah, I think people should be getting at least two an hour. Like I know like if I'm running two and a half hours, like I'm having uh, at least – I'm having probably having four gels plus then 500 mils of flat Coke, which is the equivalent of probably another two gels anyway. So um, I think most people probably underfuel than overfuel. Um, yeah. That's where the bonking happens at the end. That's what's yeah. happening, running out. Pretty rare to overfuel. Like it, it's just – logistically very difficult on a course like that where there's only access to aid stations every 5k yeah but the belts and stuff you can wear these days as well and the pockets in your shorts and stuff yeah you still got to carry that though still got to carry uh, six one in each hand yeah overfueling is difficult um I, yeah i I, th- I think overfueling is difficult anyway <laughs> you would have to be taken on a, a lot more than you normally would like we get a pretty good look at what the average runner is taking through the store. We might have like five to 10 people a day coming in for gels and everyone we ask, what are you doing at the moment? And it's like, oh, I might take one for a half marathon. I'm thinking about two, having two yeah. for the marathon. Hmm. So yeah, no one's taken that. So that's, and, and that's 50 grams they're thinking for a marathon. Yeah. Like obviously for, for a first marathon, like there's probably like a handful of mistakes that people make, like one's pacing, but I reckon up there is like underestimating how much you have to fuel for the marathon. And and I made that mistake. Yeah, um, you know, you go through 15, 20 K, like you don't need you like at 20 K, like you're still feeling good. You probably wouldn't need any nutrition up to that point. So you need to take this stuff on before you start to feel crap. So, you know, hit it hard pretty early. And there's still time to practice. Like that's, yeah. If you can train your body to hold it, um, it's a good time to practice now. That's good, fellas. I'm getting excited. I've been hearing some whispers, and I think next week we get to announce more of the elite field. But um, I'm hearing one big male, big friend of the show, been on the show as an interview before. Listeners will know him. Um, a bit of a hint, Moose and him spent some time together at a marathon once, a long amount of time. See if anyone guesses that. But no, no, you, we're talking about good runners though, right? Very, very good runners. Very. When Moose was running very quick in a marathon. From Australia? I can't say anymore. You know who it is, don't you? Or are you just trying to get more hints out of me? No, I don't know who it is. I'll tell you off air. Um, limited spot still available. Register. For, oh, I know who it is. You know it? Regist- oh, I'm guessing who it is, yeah. You know him? A bit, I of know a, it bit is. of a shock I when I saw it this New Zealand, actually. Yeah, Zealand? New Zealander. Can't say anymore. Limited spot still available. Yeah, Register for the night. Boys, faster. I need to read this, all right? Significantly yeah. faster than uh, the Ah, folks, can't hear. What <laughs> <laughs> Limited spots are still available. Register for the Nike Melbourne Marathon Festival today to secure your spot. Sunday, the 2nd of October. Your city, your run, melbournemarathon.com.au for more information. Can't wait. Got some announcements about Melbourne Marathon, actually. Not um not an official Melbourne Marathon event, so I'll stick to that at the end of the show. Moose on the loose, purchase of the week. Moose, what do you got? Ah. Uh... You boys heard about the Athletics Australia Marathon Championships? Oh, I went on their website the other day, actually, because... On which website? I went on Athletics Australia's website. No, you couldn't have. Yeah. Well, maybe you did, but I, I just looked went up, on them too. I looked up competitions, because I was thinking about this, because it actually didn't happen last year. Remember they said they were going to postpone it, and then I was thinking, oh, it might pop up at Melbourne, and because I obviously ran Melbourne, I'm like, this is going to be good, I can maybe get um you know top 10 at australian marathon championships and then i looked it up the other day i'm just on the website now oh uh, i'm on the website changed. yeah it's it's been locked in it's been locked in so when i went the other day because i screenshotted this and put it on my computer so i reckon what day? On, i reckon on the background of my screen here sorry this isn't prepared at all this is um Oh, how, uh, yeah, screenshot. I took this at 8.13 p.m. on the 30th of August. So what's that? Five days ago. And it said, date 2BC, location 2BC, host event 2BC, 
2022 Australian Marathon Championships. But now I see they've got a date here. And it's they do, oh. they do. It's um, so it's Gee, it's next weekend. I don't, I don't know when it was, but yeah, it's uh, Sunday the 18th of September. I and thought Melbourne would have had this, but it's going to no, be Sydney next week. Not sure how it gets. Um, not sure how it gets allocated. I think it's a bidding, something about bidding, maybe some application. However, it's the time frame that's the problem here. If you are an Australian athlete and you actually consider this event credible. How would you know when it's on? How are you going to prepare for it in three weeks' time? It's literally three weeks, the the announcement process, until the race. Has this it, is a marathon we're talking about. I haven't seen it being posted, though. No, well, that's, that's Look, the I, other thing. Yeah, if I, I didn't I went, then click on that again today, I only went on it five days ago and it wasn't posted. The Sydney Marathon doesn't have an Instagram. I don't can't find it anyway. If they do, it's very difficult to find. Um Athletics Australia haven't posted anything on their Instagram. There's nothing in news releases on their website. So how are you supposed to find out about this? Like, I don't understand. And also, it's just incredibly unorganized to be posting. This is a national championship meet. There's points associated to this. In the IAAF, you get points for national championships. And um, and it's there's just, a teams competition. So states are meant to organise yeah. their teams. And... It's taking the piss, isn't it? It's like no one gives – just say, hey, this is a fucking Mickey Mouse event. We don't expect anyone to do it. That's that's what AA's basically said here. Well, it really only opens it up to people who had planned on doing that event anyway. Like, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, because, you know, no one's going to – or people who are sort of marathon fit – with maybe another marathon a couple of weeks away and then go, oh, okay, Aussie chance, maybe I'll just go a couple of weeks earlier. But, um, but how can AA not sit down at the start of a calendar year and go, all right, which marathon is it going to be? Mm. Like how you have to tell people. You can't leave it to like the end of their championships. Yeah, okay, the Com Games, the World Champs is on. Okay, we had cross country. And then go, all right, what's next? Oh, the marathon. Oh, yeah, we'll do it in three weeks. That's just not how athletics works. It's not how marathoners think. It's not how national organisations should behave. But uh, are you surprised, given that when when was our World Championship marathon team announced and our Commonwealth Games marathon team announced? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'm, well, I'm not surprised, but it still doesn't stop me from talking about it. Because, yeah. it, like, if if we don't talk about it, the, like, people aren't going to know that this is occurring. And this is, like, massive – this is a massive issue. So, um, so should should uh, there be an asterisk against this year's marathon champion, like Australian marathon champ? Given it's... no, I don't think there's no, I don't think so. I think like the athlete that does it and wins it's the winner. There shouldn't be an asterisk. It's just like <laughs> just get your shit together. <laughs> Come together at the start of the year. This is the races. These there'll be a list that they have to do. Okay, we've got national road running champs. We got cross country champs. Here's our national track and field championships. Here's our marathon champs. Here's our half marathon champs. All right. Now let's set out the calendar for the year so everyone knows. Mm. That's how. It's like that's not a difficult move. thing. Yeah. Surely it surely isn't. Oh. Anyway. It makes me sad though because it, yeah, as you said, it impacts the credibility of the event so much because it's just like we don't, well, no one, no one has an opportunity to prepare for it. No one cares about it. Like it's, it could pretend. I don't know. Do do you know any Australians running this event? No, I don't know anyone. It it and it also I think of someone like a because the points are going to play a really big um. A really big role because the standards have got so much quicker so those fringe athletes who aren't going to hit the time that it can potentially i don't know what the hell is going on ah, my phone just went nuts <laughs> the, the athletes who potentially aren't going to hit the time but were a chance to go to something like the world let, let's use sarah klein last last world chance for example didn't have the time went to newcastle got close to the time relied on ranking points got picked on the team. These ranking points at this event would be worth so much more than the Newcastle Marathon she did and much more organised event and stuff as well. Um, and now she's, she's she might have heard this news on this podcast and she's like, oh, I've got two weeks to prepare for it. 
Mm. Well, yeah, it's especially if this gets labelled this race, like um, that's when some big points will start coming in. A it's not the of race late... though; it's Athletics Australia that the moose on the list. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, the race has nothing. The race is maybe the race has even just stepped up and said, "Yeah, we'll host it." as a favor or as a <laughs> i don't know this is all i don't know about the back of house stuff um you, yeah because the race isn't really advertising it you can't see it on the races web i couldn't find it on that's the, the thing web. yeah the athletes australia says click on the race website here and i was expecting if i clicked on that it would take me to the the australian championships page on the website but it's just to the sydney running festival website and there's nothing on there yeah, yeah, there was. So, have Athletics Victoria and are they announced it yet? Like, are they announced we need to pick teams for this? Um, Athletics Victoria, I, I haven't seen. Like, if I'm a Victorian marathon runner and I'm like, okay, I want to go to the Australian chair, oh, that's an opportunity I'd be interested in. I still yeah. don't know about this until you brought it up on air. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, they, I, I don't know. I haven't. Let me go on Athletics Victoria. Like, um, how are they going to get a team together? Team entries close. Oh no, that's sorry. I don't know how to make this sound go off. All it's right, nice it's background off. music. It's off. Um, I'm going through their Instagram now yeah. just to see. But you think no, every state body's in it. the same boat, aren't they? There's no post about it. Yeah, and again, this isn't their fault. This is um, yeah. This is this has come at them from AA. Jeez, that's messy. Anyway. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Because, yeah, I didn't actually know it had been announced because, as I said, I looked at it last week and it hadn't. I was just assuming it was going to Melbourne. But then even four weeks' notice would have been, like, do you know? Rough. Do you know Athletics Australia owns Blackmore's Sydney Running Festival? Yeah, I did know that, I think. Mm. I don't know that. Yeah. So it's not Wayne Lardner's he ma- event. His, his, his company he- manages it. His company manages it, but, but it's it, owned by Athletics Australia. So AA own it and profit from it. You'd think so. Well, as the owner, they would profit mm. from it, and they would pay a they would pay a race director fee and an organize like a management fee, I guess, to the organizer Wayne. Mm. But yeah. I've always found this one weird. Like you go onto Melbourne Marathon and there's a thing for elite athletes, like wanting to you know if there's some like sort of assistance or prize money or whatever. Yeah, you, know, you do the same thing at Gold Coast, but the Sydney Marathon Festival, like, there's n- none of that. There's no like, where do you apply for like elite, ath- like for an elite start, or like, what's the prize money? There's like none of that. And I like, this, I saw and, that. And, well, I haven't seen really. I went um, on to the marathon. It had a little elite athlete section. I've, I've never good. been out. Of, oh no, no, you're right. There's yeah, nothing there. I've never seen it, and like, this is the one that's meant to be the. Oh no, um, it's, I found it. It said. For elite assistance or a preferred start, contact the race director here. Male sub two forty, preferred start. What about any prize money? Um, doesn't say on there. Not on that section. And like this is the one that's like the you know the world marathon major candidate, and like <laughs> you can't even find what the prize money is or yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I've seen the um, elite start list, and it's pretty impressive. For the for the Sydney, yeah, can't say who it is yet though. Many Aussies, ah, uh, the international elite field. Haven't yeah. seen an Australian. Yeah, that's why I asked that before. Do we know any Australians doing it? So, um, yeah, good point, Moose. See if we can get to any um sort any of that out in the next couple of weeks. Kind of cut listen a question because we've been going for long enough as it is. So I'm going to wrap up the show, boys. What's coming up? I did have him. Moose, when is the Australian Marathon Championships happening? Mm. Does anyone know? Question, question answered. Um, Diamond League finals coming up. That's Thursday, the 8th of September, Switzerland time. Um, and then also, Ben, just working in the background here, Melbourne Marathon live show. Croaks, you can't be with us in Melbourne this year. Can't get down. No, no. But I'm, uh, Moose and I have been just plugging away, seeing if we can get something sorted. Zach are behind the scenes is trying to get some stuff sorted. And it's looking pretty good. So a lot of our patron supporters are writing in, saying, could we do something similar at Melbourne that we did at Gold Coast? So I'm going to try and find a third co-host, Croaks, to fill your seat. Very hard um, shoes to fill, but I'll see Not how we go. Hard. Ernie Old coming on board. They sponsored the podcast last week when we uh, gave away one of their, or I think we gave, they gave away two of their long-sleeve running tops. 
about 600 entries on that competition, boys. That was light up Instagram during the week. Uh, so it's going to be Ernie Old, going to be inside running podcasts, a live show, and a bit of an unofficial Melbourne Marathon post-race drinks. So all the all the organisations you hear on this podcast, Run to PB, Run Strong, Bendigo Mats, Geelong Cats, Melbourne Uni. You know anyone who's uh, interested to have a couple of beers afterwards, after the live show, there'll be a venue you'll be able to come to. Tickets will go quick to the live show. We can only fit about 70 into the venue. As always, we'll uh, go to our Patreon supporters first. So on about Wednesday, we're thinking Patreons, you'll be able to see a bit of an announcement for that one there. Should be good. We'll do all the uh, usual segments and um, yeah, hopefully get a big name to fill Crokes' shoes and also a few winners, hopefully, over the day can pop in for some short interviews like we did up at the Gold Coast with Jess and Andy. So something to look out for. Um, yeah, Patreon supporters, details Wednesday, and then I'll have more details on the show next week. Anything else to add there, Moose? Zach has pretty much organised the whole thing. Man, you were just um, getting on the microphones. Yeah, you did say me and Moose have been doing this, and I was like, <laughs> oh, I've been doing shit. <laughs> I'll, read, I'll read a couple of messages per day, maybe give, maybe send a screenshot of some moron that I see on Instagram. That's about it. <laughs> So a massive thanks there to Ernie Old for uh, partnering with us for that one. Uh, interview this week, boys, Hugh Van Kolenberg, spoke about it at the top of the show. The guy from the Resilience Project, the guy from the Imperfects podcast, does a lot of speaking, talk about all the stuff he does in the introduction, so I won't say it all again, but I'm um, a pretty well-known person here in Australia. Try not to talk to him about the stuff that he uh, often talks about and presents about. I just wanted to talk to him about his running. He's got some wheels, got some cool views on running and stuff, and um yeah, a bit of a fanboy moment for me because I've consumed a lot of his content over the years and it was great to sit down with him for 70 minutes and have a chat. He's obviously a very good speaker because that's what he does for a job. And um, yeah, time went very quickly. So I hope that the listeners enjoy this one and we'll do it all again next week, fellas. Anything happening in your life that of note before we shut things down tonight? Uh, no, hopefully a bit of running. Yeah, get better, Bradley. Yeah. <clears throat> Ditto. Try. Hopefully, some running. I'm not you. You, but you both will both beat me. I'm having a week down, thirty minutes, every day. Good idea. Take. Is your boy Toby as well? What's he doing? Is he having a down week? Very much so. He's going to be so much better than you too. I'm not sure if we said that you coach him now, Toby Mende. Since April. Since April. It's going well, actually. We 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 had Ballarat and Burnley pegged as two races, mainly Ballarat as the two races that we wanted him to really go well at, and he's done it. Done it. Um, and then Valencia, he's running. So what time do you think he'll run there? Um, 2.15 to 16.30. Mm. You? Yeah, he can, he can run. Yeah, yeah. He, he can. Yes, that's what I think too. I think he – so his very first race was when I raced him in Canberra. Um, because, he, you know, he was a talented junior, wasn't he? And then he went away from the sport yeah. and then he's come back to the sport. And I used him as a bit of a yardstick for a while because I was racing him a bit when he first came back to the sport. But now I've realised, I'm like, no, no, this guy's just getting better and better and he's actually in a different category to me now. And I think he's going to continue to, like, push forward. I think he's a name to watch for sure. To run 65 low the way he did on the weekend. Um, off oh, a th- big off week a, too. Off a 31.10. Um, first 10k like he's he's come home super strong and with eight u-turns in there he's probably a 60 64 30 guy he's been running for two years yeah it's it's exciting he's set himself up with the life to do it as well you'll have to interview him moose uh yeah he's not not a great talker old toby what about i felt sorry for him though because he um obviously is a ballarat boy but runs for geelong must be like a financial incentive or something there I'm not sure why he'd run for another town culture that you live thing. in just the culture thing. but then the geelong supporters on the side of the road don't know who he is so they yell out go geelong and i'm like that's a bit rough he's a star of the team and they just don't know his name just yell out. and you know they're geelong supporters because they're, they're just... coming the opposite way on the road in a geelong top and they go go geelong go geelong and i'm like hang on it's like Andy Buchanan running along in a Bendigo singlet and the Bats fans are calling him Bendigo. Understand your main player down Geelong there. Geelong runs very deep. Geelong runs down to like multiple Division 7 sites. So hey, you I don't would, even have a women's team. I don't know how deep you can be. I w- I w- like, I don't, it's like 30 to 40 people. You reckon when Craig Mottram was there, people didn't know his names? Toby's a new Mottram down there. 
what? No, no, not yet he isn't. Oh, he's gonna Toby's be, gonna Toby be runs second at Burnley. Second's a good run. Yeah, maybe not Craig Bottrom. I've exaggerated things a bit there. A bit of mayo on that story. Anyway, interviewing Moose would be good to hear. Brady's new man crushes. Hey? We know your uh, new man crushes. Toby, you're cutting out croaks. I know you're saying good stuff about me, but you're cutting out. You're cutting out. You're cutting out. You're cutting out. Throw the laptop against the wall. Than All right, boys, we're doing it. Enjoy the Shoe Van Kylenberg interview. Ladies and gents, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. See ya. This week's guest on the Inside Running podcast could possibly be the fastest 400-metre runner we've ever had on the show in the last five years. <laughs> he is a well-respected and renowned name in Australia as he has worked as the creator of the Resilience Project and has partnered with many elite sports teams, over 1,000 schools and 500 workplaces, and has reached over 1 million people. I'm looking forward to having a conversation today about how running fits into all that. So welcome to the podcast, Hugh Van Kylenberg. How are you going? Brady, I'm, I'm good, mate. I, I probably have to, just what you said before about being the fastest 400 metre runner. I, I reckon, think you are. Well, potentially only because the other guests you've had haven't timed themselves over 400 metres. That might be, that might be. In fact, I reckon a few of them would probably run my time repeat effort, like we would do it five laps in a row <laughs> if they yeah. wanted to. Well, I think, you know, Ollie Horse, Dewey probably have kicked down faster at the end of a 1500 or 3K. <laughs> you, you this didn't take anything away from your 400-meter PB, which we'll get to in a second. But, um, yeah, when I was looking through the guest list, I'm pretty sure none of them have done an all-out 400 as quick as you have. Uh, yeah, that surprises me. That really surprises me. But I'll, I'll take it. I'll take definitely it. take it. <laughs> definitely take it. Hugh, you joined us from Melbourne today. How's things on your Tuesday afternoon? Uh, it's a little bit frustrating today because I had planned a session before this, um, but my we, we just had our third child. And I honestly, last night I checked my Garmin before, I had two hours and 10 minutes sleep. And I just feel like, I just think it's counterproductive running after two hours and 10 minutes sleep. I think you just have to just park it and go, it's not happening today. I'll have to revisit it again tomorrow. Um, so a little bit frustrated today because I did have a really good session planned, but uh, not to be. Yeah, you got to be flexible. And I think I did check uh, our Instagram DMs at about 7 a.m. this morning just to uh, organise this conversation today. And I think it said you were active like four hours ago or three hours ago. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's been up in the early hours of the morning, so that would make sense. Yeah, some further evidence. to It was, uh, yeah, it was my five-year-old who was up from midnight till five last night and I just couldn't get him back down. And yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I turned to Instagram at, at, at about probably three in the morning for just something to do because I knew I wasn't going back to sleep. So, uh, but yeah, good, good pick up. Hey, Hugh, what we do on this podcast when we have guests is we often introduce them by their personal best. So I've only got two PBs down here for you at the moment, but we'll start yeah, right. with a 400. I haven't got the tenths and hundredths of a second, but I think you're a 52 second guy over 400 metres. I know you've won a couple of Masters over 35 and maybe over 40 titles down here in Victoria. So have I got yeah. that one right? And any stories about it? Well, this is an interesting one. I don't, I have so many stories about this. This is just, just before we kick off, this is, I have done so many podcast interviews <laughs> this year and I don't care if the other podcasts are listening to this. This is the most excited I've been to do a podcast. I've wanted an excuse to talk about running so much. I try and crowbar it into other podcasts and they steer me away very quickly because it's not what they want to talk to me about. This for me is like my, in fact, there was a stage where we were getting ready for the national tour and my manager said, no more podcasts. You're doing too many podcasts. I need you to just rest. And, I, and, I, and she said, so I'm saying no to everything. And I said, oh, just so you know, if Inside Running contact you, it's a yes for them. And she's like, who's that? And I went, don't, doesn't matter. Just it's a yes for them. So we'll take this, that. Is, Thank this, you. this is very exciting for me. So yeah, we've got a whole guess, hour. Yeah. <laughs> I've already wasted a bit of it. So I'll <laughs> get right into it. But yeah, I guess my, um, my, my running story is such a weird one in that I, athletics for me as a kid. Now, uh, the other question for you is, is this, 
Is this a Shoe Geeks episode as well? Or this is just a, because I could do Shoe Geeks like you would not believe, but I'm happy just to focus on running if you well, like. This is on the weekly one, but I have got a few questions about your shoes of choice. So I'm going to work it in there. So don't worry about that. So okay. I've got you let covered. Me, let me, okay. So let me get back to my PB. So I did run a 52. I started athletics when I was 38 years old, which is a strange time to pick up athletics. I did it at school and it was actually my favorite sport. It's a sport I love most, but I did a little bit better at cricket and I ended up pursuing cricket for a long time, much longer than I should. But I, would, I used to play for Melbourne University and behind the Melbourne University main oval, so this is grade cricket in Melbourne, there's an athletics track. And every Saturday I'd stand there at fine leg in between my overs and I'd look over my shoulder at the ass track and I'd look at people training and I'd, I'd honestly just think, I wish I was doing that. That's what I want to be doing. But it took me till I was 38 years old and um, to start again. And I used to, when I was at school, I did ones and twos and loved it. And I ran, I remember in year 12, I ran a, um, and, I, and I will get to answer your question in a minute. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, my, um, it was a, I was like, I was an okay 100 meter and 200 meter runner it, at school level. I was in the APS from Takiri Grammar and I was okay in years seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And they're all the scholarship boys from Halebury and Caulfield, really quick ones and twos runners. And um, year 12 came along and it was the first meet of the season down in Geelong. And we would always do paper, scissors, rock to see who had to go in the first heat because no one wanted to get smashed by the yeah. Caulfield boys. And I lost it. And I was like, ah, oh, damn it, I have to go in the first heat with all the really quick boys. This will be embarrassing. I'd done a year with the VIS for cricket, the Victorian Institute of Sport, and basically they just smashed us with speed stuff all winter. And I hadn't realised it was speed stuff. It was this thing they called circuit running. No, unit running. They called it unit running, which was basically a long... 15 minute jog followed by short interval sprints. And we did that all winter. And I got up on the blocks and it was a hundred and I ran it in a 10, seven, eight and won pretty easy. And I was like, yeah. wow, what the hell? That was weird. And that all that season, I ran 10 eights and loved it and ran some real quick twos as well. But then school finished and I was like, okay, I guess you just stop. Um, I guess you just stop now. I think you just stopped mm. running. I'll go and play cricket. And yeah, then when I was 38 years old, I said to my wife, I'm going to do athletics. I'm going to do 400s because my hamstrings will not cope with a one and a two. And I, um, I said, come down to the Oval with me. There was a grass track near where we lived back when we lived near Mornington, Mornington Secondary College there. And I said, can you time me for a 400? She said, what time do you want to get? And I said, I don't know. I'll probably get about a 55, 56, if I don't really know. And I ran, a, I ran uh, 69 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so just over 250k pace. It's not disastrous. Yeah, I mean, it's not great for 400, yeah, considering yeah. I was hoping to get a 55. Yeah, true, and, I thought, yeah. and I thought, that's so embarrassing. I think I'm never going to do athletics ever again. But the next day I woke up, I went, no, that's why I need to do it. I'm so out of shape. And um, yeah, just trained so hard. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just ran a lot and did lots of sessions. And yeah, won the Masters three years ago, but that's because I was the only one in my age group, yeah. <laughs> age 35 to 40. Yep. No one else was in it. No one Men else 35, up. I did see that when I was doing some research, but still, yep. you're not meant to tell people that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, I, I know. I should keep it quiet, but it's just, it's ridiculous when you run a lap by yourself and there's no one else there. <laughs> people, like, there's no one cheering. Everyone's just like, why is that guy running by himself? Oh, they didn't put you in with the other guys. They could have put you in lane win. nine or eight or something out in the outside. Yeah, I know. They should have. They should have. Mm. Um, but instead, I did a solo race. And then the next year, there's a few more athletes. But yeah, but anyway, very long story short, my PB for the 400, I did a 52-1 in um, mm. end, end of last season. Um, yeah, which was which kind of surprised me because I usually run mid-53s, but it was nice to... At, um, at what age? What age were you when you hit that PB? 41. 41. Yeah. So it's not so, the traditional way that you get into sprinting. And was there ever like a recreational running kind of a park run or a local fun run or anything in that gap there, or just went straight yeah. from nothing to sprinting? No, I went, I did. Um, I went through a stage where I was pretty full on about, I'd run the tan yeah. and, but that's all I'd do. I just ran the tan three times a week and I was really and every with time? myself. Yeah. I never thought to do like <laughs> interval sessions to try and improve or just short jog. speed stuff. I just, I just ran that 3.78 guys three times a week. <laughs> religiously and I get it and I was so flat that I never got quicker I, I just stayed at the same pace because I wasn't training properly and then I'd always end up with like tendonitis in my left knee or and injuries would just always get me and I never loved it I just did it because I felt like I should be running and then when I reached 38 I was like well I used to be a sprinter and I love that I don't think I'm built for long distance but then when I tried to sprint I just couldn't and it's, it's an amazing feeling to actually get better at something the older you get mm -hmm. like I, I think most things in life we kind of drop away and 
certainly with cricket after the age of 22, 23 as a bowler, I just got slower and slower and shitter and shitter basically. And to the point where I only played because I love the club. I didn't like playing cricket anymore. So now I've gone, you know, each week I get quicker and quicker. I, I don't, to be honest, I don't think I'll get much quicker than um, a 52. I think I, I may have peaked, but if I can stay below 53, 54 for the next few years, that'll be a great feeling um, to do. I just, I just love, I cannot put into words and I know everyone listening will resonate with this, but just the experience of athletics and running, I just love it so much. It's all I think about. Like I've got some big things happening in my life, but it's honestly, I just lie in bed thinking about running. That's all I do. <laughs> That's all I do. <laughs> I'm the same first thought when I wake up every day. I'm like, what day is it today? And do I have a session or a long run or an easy job? Yeah. Like what, what, yeah, how does my run impact my day before it even starts? It's, it's so true. Like, and, it, and even now what I've realized, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. And I, some of your listeners are not, have you heard of um, the Feed the Cats program? You heard Feed the Cats? No, I haven't. No. So if you look up Feed the Cats, there's a, he's a university high school, uh, he's a university coach over in the US, track coach. And he's come up with this program called Feed the Cats, which I've just come across recently. And his theory basically is for sprinters, like cats don't ever run. They either, they're either resting or they're sprinting. So his program is like, we're all out speed three times a week, and then we're resting and doing nothing. Um, where I've come from the mentality of playing footy and cricket, it's like the harder you work, the more you get out of it. So I was doing sessions every day, obsessively running as much as and I'm on my gum and going, I've got to get up to, I've got to get 30 Ks plus a week and otherwise I'm being lazy. And But this guy's theory, it's called Feed the Cats. He's a compelling speaker when you listen to him talk about it. Um, it's just, it's all out speed or it's nothing. And the sessions are quick. And um, I've sort of been following that recently. But to, to your point, I lie in bed watching YouTube videos at night, like, you know, I've got this, what was an example? I had a talk at uh, Hamer Hall um, early in the year. It was 2,800 people, right? It was a sellout, really big night. And my manager's come into the room to check all's good. And I had YouTube up there. And I'm just, I was like, this guy does this session, right? He does three 200 meter sprints. That's it with his sprinters. And she goes, are you serious? And I was like, <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about this. I was just running. It just, there's something about it. It, 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 um, I have a lot of people come up to me saying, oh, I'm struggling with this or depression or anxiety. And I honestly feel like saying to them, Brian, just take these pair of brand new shoes and wear them out and come back to me in six months time when you're wearing those things out and let's see how you're going. I just reckon running is such a therapeutic, healing, building activity. It's just unreal. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting more into that. And yeah, I couldn't agree more like that. Just how you feel afterwards and how you can attack the day. And, you know, if you've had a tough day, how you feel after you've had an afternoon jog or anything like that, it just is um, remarkable. But the other running result I did find from you was uh, a 5K, the Melbourne Marathon 5K. In, I think this wow. was two, yeah, 2018. We call this the Shanae Diver year because it was pretty hot and windy and pretty much 99% of the people ran a bad marathon that day other than Shanae Diver. But I got you down for 2315. That's you? I don't even, what is, yeah, I did run in it. Is that, is that, that's pretty slow, isn't it? Oh, that's not too bad. Just a four minute K pace. Oh, okay. I don't, in four thirties. Okay. It was a, um, why did I do that? I can't remember. Oh, that's right. For work, we did this. We got all our staff at the Resilience Project and we said, we're going to do an event together. It's going to be a special day. I think it'd be great if we did something. It was only about 15 of us at the time, but I said, we're going to do it together. And what I didn't realize was, we didn't have a meeting point. I didn't realize how big those things were. So yeah. no one saw anyone at any point of the day and we didn't <laughs> catch up till when then like most people went home because they're sick of waiting for everyone else's event. And I think everyone else did the half marathon. I was like, I don't think I'll make a half marathon. My, my knees just blow up when I get past 5K. So that's it. I, that's great. Gee, a very good research. I'm very impressed with this, Brady. It's actually very easy. You just go to this certain website, type in a name and it spits oh, out okay. every, every, any fun <laughs> okay. run you've ever done. It appears in a big list. <laughs> which um, for you, there was only just one result popped up there. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> like, oh, that was one of my questions, like going to the longer distances because everything you explain, and, and obviously, you know, you're pretty um, you're pretty out there with your own podcast, The Imperfects, and your two books, and people would have heard you speak and stuff before, but a lot of things that you talk about I think are more suited to the longer distance yeah, and that meditative totally. state and jogging along and kind of more of the lower heart rate stuff, I'd probably call it, where you can kind of clear the mind, I guess, um, compared to the sprinting. So are there any kind of aspirations to go longer or, or even middle distance? I, so it's just such a great question and such a good observation. I, I think most people know the feeling of a longer run where you can start off feeling a bit stressed and you've got issues on your mind and then they just disappear for a while. And then by the end of the run, not only are they gone, you've come up with solutions for your problems. Mm. It's such a meditative escape. So when I started doing 400s, I didn't know how to train for them. I was just by myself on a grass track and I was doing like 
um, 600 reps and 500 reps sets of like, <laughs> cause I just, I didn't know, I thought oh, I'll try and do more than 400. That'll get me, but I probably needed to, cause I was weighing it about 80, I'm six foot and I was weighing about 83, 84 kilograms when I started running and I was desperately out of shape. And, um, and I think that helped me lose a lot of the weight. I'm down to 73 now, which is probably a better weight for me for, for racing. But effectively I was training for 1500s and 800s. I wasn't really training for speed and for sprinting. And then I, through our podcast, met Katrina Bissett and she said, why don't you come and train with us? And I ended up training with her and Peter Fortune and, and all the girls in that group, an incredible group of, of runners, you know, Abby Delamonts and Yeah, just on uh, that, because you've spoken about it many times. I've heard the story a few times, but it was it just a did you just cold call hit her up to come on your show? And then it yeah. went to would you come down and do some training with us if you like running? I was sitting at a cafe in Alfington and I was reading the Herald Sun and the last there was an article about how how Katrina had just broken the eight hundred meter record. And I'd never heard of her before. And I was just getting into athletics and and I saw that and then I read it and I was like, oh, good on it. That's amazing. But then the last paragraph said, Katrina got into running to help deal with her anxiety and depression. I was like, wow, that's really interesting just for our podcast. So I sent her a DM basically and just said, hey, look, I, I, I love athletics and would love to have in the podcast. Do you want to catch up and talk about it? And we just hit it off so well when we caught up that we sort of pursued a friendship more than doing the podcast. And we it was like – during our first catch-up, she said, you should come and run with us. And I said, don't be ridiculous. That's just, I'm not doing that. But over a few months, she said, it persisted and said, you've got to come join us. You've got to come join us. And and this is early on when I was probably running the 400 in about 59 seconds, maybe a minute. And it's, I... It's pretty special because the athletic world, sorry to interrupt, is very closed off in a way oh. like if you said to me it's like i went down a park run and i saw a 16 minute guy and he said come and do some training with me i'm a 20 minute guy i'd get that or a half marathoner or a marathoner but yeah. athletic guys are really like a bit niche and a bit in their clicks and um it's kind of actually awesome to hear that 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 story happened and she kept persisting to try and get you there yeah i i, I didn't realize how big a deal it was i mean i my first thing was that's ridiculous i'm embarrassed to join you because i just don't i'm not i'm not in that I, I thank you, but but it's not for me. Like I'll yeah. just embarrass myself. And she said, "Look, it's just going to be me and a couple of the girls. You'll love the girls. Fort's great. You'll love Fort. He's pretty easy going." So I just thought, I'm so nervous and so scared of doing this. I think I just have to do it. And I remember we she, she it was at the is it um, the uh, Lakeside Stadium, and I turned up there, um, and she got me through the VIS entrance there, and we walk onto the track, and the first thing I saw was Peter Bowl training in full flight. And I was Shirt like, off. Yeah. Get off. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shirt off um, and the whole group. So there's six of them. Yeah, Joey and, Dang, Jeff Risley, yep, all of them yep, shirts off, yeah. Yep, all there. And all of them have – there's seven of them and I'm counting there's like 84 abs amongst all of them. <laughs> and they're just tearing around the track. And I said to Katrina, I thought it was just us. And she goes, oh, in our group, yeah, but the boys are training. And, oh, there's another group over there. Oh, and there's Lyndon Hall. She's running just there. And I was so embarrassed. I'm wearing tracksuit pants like a dad would wear when he's watching the footy. I'm wearing this baggy T-shirt. And there's actually a photo. Someone took a photo of the boys training and put it online. And I'm actually in the background standing there with my hands on my hips, just looking like just in <laughs> shock, like, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> um, and I joined in the session. I was so embarrassed the whole way because I was just, I couldn't keep up. A, it, um, I was feeling really embarrassed. You might know Abby Delamont, who's an incredible yep. 800, used to be fours. Um, and she turned up just before the session started and she's such an incredibly nice and warm person. She gave me the biggest hug and goes, welcome to the group. I'm so pumped. She had no idea who I was. She's probably thinking, what on earth is this old man doing joining us? But hey, he's very welcome. She was so nice. I was like, well, they're a very nice community. Um, I'll just, I'll do this one training with them. It's a funny story. I'll tell everyone about it on the podcast because this is just embarrassing. And I was, we, I can't, I think the session we did was 10 200s on a, I think, um, off a, a minute or off two minutes. And and then a 400 at the end. And I was, I've never felt pain like it, but it was the most addictive. Uh, it was like playing golf and hitting one good shot and you go, well, I'm coming back to that one good shot. The feeling I had afterwards, I couldn't, I was so hooked. And I thought, well, I'm going to gonna go away and work pretty hard on my own so that I do actually, do I actually fit in, so I can actually fit into this group and, and be here on my own, right? Um, but yeah, it was an amazing. And then I was with Fort and, and Katrina for the next uh, well, a year and a bit really. And it was an incredible experience. And, and by the end, I was able to keep up with them. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, just seeing people 
like seeing Peter Bowl up close running and mm. Katrina Bissett running, it's something else. Like it's it's you feel like you're watching the best in the world, and it's just it's yeah. just unreal. And in lane two, that close to him, do you know what I mean? If they're going past in lane one, or they're taking you on the outside, like getting the getting the best seat in the house of watching some of those guys operate is um is even different from being in the stands. Did you know who Peter Fortune was at the time and the Kathy Freeman connection? And that would have been pretty special as well. I did. I, I knew he'd. Yeah, I knew about Peter Fortune. I was a huge, well, I still am a, a huge Kathy Freeman fan. And so I was very nervous about this Peter Fortune guy. I was just expecting him to go, what are you doing here? Like, I know Katrina invited you down, but I'm trying to create a high performance elite yeah. environment here. We don't need you chasing him around, <laughs> this old man chasing him around. But he was just so unbelievably welcoming. And he said, we would love to have you in the group. He said, I don't coach men as a rule. They just tend to not, but I, I, it's great to have you here. And we sort of started this, we've got this great, I spoke to him, I gave him a call a couple of days ago. We've got this great fr- uh, friendship. I, it's almost like a fatherly type figure in my life. He's, he's this, um, he's an incredible man. I don't see him as much anymore with Katrina now um, being coached by Ned up in Sydney, yeah. but, um, but I, uh, I've been busy of late, but I, I do plan to stay close to Fort because he's a, he's a fantastic man with a great wealth of knowledge. And I love, I love that kind of person who, he may not have studied, you know, done all the study and all that kind of stuff, but he's just got this incredible wealth of knowledge about about the sport of running, four mm. hundreds in particular. Yeah, it was really well documented in that documentary on ABC they did on Kathy Freeman a yes. couple of years ago. And his yeah, every time he spoke on that, he didn't say much, but every time he spoke, it's like, oh, that's just a great quote about coaching and teaching and life. And um, yeah, you know, maybe he doesn't have all the qualifications and all the things next to his name, but what he's being able to do in the athletics world is um yeah quite special what did you learn from them in the early days so you're coming in super green um not knowing a lot about running or athletics or how how to kind of train and what were your kind of takeaways in that first maybe month or two oh there's so much so i had no idea what to expect and i you, i couldn't have been more green I, I played eight years of aussie rules footy at an amateur club i played 22 years of premier cricket here in melbourne where it's a huge team environment, where quite genuinely, the better off your teammate is, the better you're going to go. And it's all about the team winning. To then go to an environment where it's an individual sport, but at training, when you work as a team, you just, it's, it's, I found it fascinating. Cause I was like, I couldn't get my head around the dynamics of like, these girls are in competition, like they race each other, but they're training together. So it's almost like competition at training, but it's a friendly environment. But I can tell there's a lot on the line. Every single time we take off, there's a lot on the line here. And there's a lot of, not in a bad way, but a lot of ego at, 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 um, at stake. So I found that fascinating. I'll tell you what I, what I did find was that, first of all, when you run as a group, you run so much quicker. <laughs> like, Which can be a bad ins- thing. Yeah, it, it can if be. you're not and, ready for it, yeah. Yeah, and it shocked me because like they, like, like they take off and – Quite a few times you go, whoa, I can't keep up, but you have to because you're in the middle. Like you don't yeah. have a choice. You're amongst all those go. people. So you just you just find a way to – so what I found was you push yourself to a, to a whole new level as a group. Um, what I'm used to with football and cricket is the coach will sit you down at the start and they give you this huge explanation of what training's about, why we're doing this session, where it fits into the overall plan, um, and there's a lot of motivation as well around like a lot of pep talks and we've got to get this done for this reason. You can do this. You're amazing and blah, blah, blah. And, um, with running to me so far, my experience is here's a session. This is what we're doing. You just do it. You just smash it out. Mm-hmm. Um, which is very different to me. It took a while to get used to that. Cause I was, I remember one day a few people were late and I think it was bad weather or something. And people were sort of arriving at different times. And like, oh, you just start now. You start now. And I was going, no, no, we need to do this together. Guys, we can't. What are we doing? Let's have a chat about this. People are late. That's okay. Let's talk. But it was like, where's this person? I don't know where they are. Let's just go. And it, it, to me, it was, it's just a very different experience to what I'm used to. But um, what have I learned? I haven't even answered the question, buddy. Um, That's right. I've had a good chat about it. You've kind of I, answered a few times. I, I, I'm very inspired. I, I'm very inspired watching everyone else train. I find it an inspiring environment to be in. I mean, they're obviously the best in Australia and and a lot of them are the best in the in, amongst the best in the world. So um I, I do want to feel like when I played cricket at grade level, which is a really good level, um, it's like the level below first class cricket, you'd often get these guys turning up who we had five sides and they would turn up to play in the fists and they were never that good at cricket, but they loved it because they were training with first 11 players. I, I felt like that fifth 11 player turning up to running and I just felt grateful that they were happy to have me. 
And um, I just feel, I mean, some people probably still, I'm sure some of the people see me training going, what is, what is he doing here? But for the most part, everyone's, everyone's pretty welcoming. Do you, um, because you do have a front row seat of it, and I'm sure you ride the roller coaster when they then go off to Com Games or World Champs or Olympics or whatever it is, um, and then you see how the sport kind of gets treated in the mass media. Like, does that do your heading compared to other sports you work with? I guess like the AFL and the NRL. Like, I was actually surprised when you said there was an article on Cat Bissett in the um, Herald Sun yeah. because we wouldn't see a lot of media in Australia here. But um, I guess now that you've seen what they put in and what kind of recognition they get, um, okay, must so be, yeah, interesting I'm, observations. I'm very passionate about this. So I, um, so this year, my two clubs I worked with was Queensland State of Origin. I was with them. So the highs of that experience. But then I was also with Carlton Football Club this year in the AFL who oh, okay. missed out on the finals by half a percent. Mm. The first team ever to be in the top eight the whole season and drop out the last I'm a Collingwood oh. supporter as well. I must, oh. I must just say that. We, did <laughs> talk, we just... actually talked about it on the start of this episode that, that you're going to be on. So, um, yes, yeah, I'll just okay, put that in so, there. Okay, so, um, and, you know, in that environment, you know, I'm on a Queensland State of Origin camp before State of Origin 1, and everything's like, let's be careful we don't go here because that'll end up in the paper. We don't want an article about this. We're doing this, but, guys, the media will be there. So when we're there, make sure you're dressed in this this stuff. Now, they, I mean, they're pretty elite. They're, 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 don't get me wrong. They're... Um, their elite group and the AFL, you know, to be in an AFL side, you have to be in the top 700 footballers in Australia or whatever it is, something like that. Maybe it's a bit less, maybe it's top 600, whatever it is. It does my head in that there is no coverage for someone, you know, like a Katrina Bissett, who is Australia's fastest ever woman over 800 metres. Mm -hmm. She's in the top, I mean, she's kind of fifth in the Commonwealth. That that Commonwealth race was it was an elite standard. I think some of their races weren't as elite. That was elite. Her eight hundred. Yeah. Um, you look at um, Stewie. I mean Ollie Hoare. You look at um, oh my gosh. You, you look at Peter Bowl. Like he got a little bit of media around the Olympics time, a little bit around the World Championships. But to be in the top four fastest men in the world over that distance, mm -hmm. that is so much more elite than ninety nine point nine percent of the AFL population. Ninety nine point five percent of the nrl population there's always the other thing that really annoys me is that i mean i actually probably used to buy into it but i used to when i was playing football i would often hear people saying oh he could be he could be a olympic runner if he wanted to oh, yeah. this guy could be this guy could this guy could if you want to be a runner he could be and i used to buy into that bit going yeah he's uh, he's an amazing runner i've seen the best in the world up close there's only one afl player currently who could probably mix it in in um, blitzards i reckon um well he was he come from athletics yeah you racing, racing athletics. back in the day yeah yeah well, okay there you go so you can attest that he was obviously yeah. quite quick the rest of them have got a great tank but they don't have that extraordinary speed and that uh you know there was a story that um uh back in the day shane crawford is the one that everyone used to speak about and say oh yeah you know shane crawford could have gone to the olympics if he wanted to eight hundreds. well he had a, like halfway through when he was at his fittest he actually had a, as you probably know, but he had a season of athletics, training for athletics, training for 800s. Yeah. And then he raced, he raced one summer. He raced an 800 and all these athletes like, I'll, I'll, I'll race him. And I think he came, he, he ran a good time. Don't get me wrong, like a 154 or something, 153 yeah. or something. But he got beaten. Yeah. He got smashed by a lot of 800 meter runners who are not even in the top 10 in Victoria. So hmm. it's just a ridiculous narrative that AFL footballers get way too excited about their running ability. They're extremely fit. Don't get me wrong. They're elite athletes. I'm not saying they're not. What they do, their strength getting knocked over, get back up. They've got this incredible tank. They can run 15Ks whilst getting smashed. That's incredible. But they don't have the speed. They, 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 they're not natural runners like our athletes are. They, they are – like my dad tells me stories. I'm so jealous of this. Dad tells me stories that he used to – dad went to Melbourne High School and he tells me stories about – finishing school on Thursdays or Friday afternoons and the whole school would walk to Olympic Park and would watch athletes. Like there, there'd be meets and, and there'd be like 5,000 people watching because it's mm -hmm. like, you know, Peter Normans and the, whoever like has come, they're racing and it's like, and people used to come to Australia, you know, the best athletes in the world used to come to Australia and race and it was, and dad said it was back page of the paper. It was back page of the, of the Sun, of the Herald. It was like, it was athletics was huge. It just, I don't know. I, I wasn't overly interested in athletics for 20 years, between the age of 20 and sort of 18 and 38. So I don't really know what happened, but how it doesn't get more media. I mean, surely people watch the Commonwealth Games and they loved it. Mm. Like people were so into the stories. Like 
it it, uh, it it infuriates me. First of all, the conversation around oh, these footballers would be Olympians if they wanted to. No, they would not. These runners are extraordinary. Like they're the best in the world. But it also annoys me how it just gets nowhere near enough coverage. How do we fix it, Hugh? I've asked this a few times on this podcast over the years. Because yeah. people that like come into the world understand the problem, and you're right, it does my head in when I'm watching the AFL and BT will say some call about he could have been an Olympic runner if he chose that path yeah. or whatever, and you're like, no, he couldn't. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's one thing to name it, and it's another thing to come up with a solution. Any ideas ticking along in your brain? With the cat biscuit example, like how do we make that her more of a hand, uh, household name, someone pretty close to you? Well, I, I, I think it starts before that. I mean, I I, I think it, we, we need to start before that. I. I don't like bagging things in public. It's not my go at all. But I have found the experience of doing athletics um, – I, I love the event. I love training. I love racing. But the whole the, – the distance I've got to travel to go and compete every Saturday, the way it's structured, I can only do a 400 or a 100. I can't do a two and a four together. Um, there's no – kind of i mean there's the high velocity club in victoria which is like there's a bit of atmosphere around that bit of a crowd it there's got to be a better way of structuring it it needs to be structured in a better way a more user-friendly model um they should have um two or three photographers that have got there i mean these days kids want to have everything on social media there should be a really good photographer down there catching unreal getting unreal footage sharing it with these kids so they can share on their socials everything um, to create a bit more hype around socials there should be we should be doing more to attract kids to athletics in the first place i mean i now i'm not saying me for example but i got beaten in year 12 at the ips final by a kid called bo betts i ran a 10 7 8 he ran a 10 6 4 or something no one came up to me after that meet and said do you want to do athletics because you you could now you may not be an olympian but you could you, you'd be good at a club like you'd be a good club sprinter um no one did that i i I went to cricket because every club in Melbourne was asking me to go. Well, not every club. That sounds arrogant. A few clubs are saying to me, you should come and play with us. I mean, I had footy clubs saying, why don't you come and play with us? I wasn't that good at football. I was, I was probably better at, I was much better at athletics, but no one said to me, why don't you come down to our club? Um, I the feel like I wasn't there. Yeah, that, that's okay. You've summarized it much better. I, I think, and I don't want to offend anyone here because I know there's probably someone's job is pathways and, and I'm sure they're probably desperately underfunded and under-resourced. Um, but if there's a more, a, a, a way to create um, a less traditional approach to athletics, maybe, you know, cricket has changed so much over the years to capture a broader market. T20 is a horrible format and I, and I can't stand it. But what it's done is it's attract, it's not for me. It's not for people who love cricket. It's for people who don't love cricket. That's why T20 is there to, and it's captured this new market of people who don't like cricket. Now they do. There needs to be some kind of drastic pivot to try and capture people you know, I don't, I, there are certain events that I don't watch, right? And there's, I'm sure there's a hierarchy of, I'm sure the hundreds of most watched event going around. So that there needs to be a way that we have more hundred meter sprints. You know, I love the footage of Usain Bolt running a 150 through the streets of London or wherever it was, mm. you know, m maybe we just have, maybe we pay a lot of money. Who's the fastest man in the world? And we, we pay him a lot of money to come and race in, in the, on the Sydney Harbour or whatever, I don't know, across the, have a hundred yeah. meter track somewhere, just, just that kind of stuff. I, and I know there's someone listening right now going, you got no idea, mate, you're so new to this sport, but that's probably my take is that I am new to this sport and I'm seeing things that to me remind me of cricket when I started in the 1990s. It's very traditional. Um, I've been yelled at by so many bloody volunteers and I love the volunteers. I think they're, I think they're great. You need volunteers, but <laughs> I've been yelled at by that many volunteers who still treat it like it was probably the sport in the seventies and eighties that yeah. I, I stood on the, I, I stood on the blocks before my 400. I stood in the middle of the blocks. Cause I didn't know they, they feel like they're going to slip. This guy goes, Oi, Melbourne uni, get off the bloody blocks. <laughs> like yelled at me. And I turned around and said, are you talking to me? And he goes, yeah, get off your blocks. I'm like, mate, I'm right here. You don't need to yell at me. I'm right here. But now I'm a four, I'm a, I was 41 when that happened. I could deal with it. If I was a 17 year old kid and I got yelled at by an old mm -hmm. man for saying the blocks, I'd go, I don't need to be doing this. I don't need to be doing this sport. I'm going to go and hang out with my mates, go to the beach in the summer. Cause that's what you're competing against as a summer mm -hmm. sport, going to the beach with your mates. So we've got to make it to, to me and it could be a friendlier, um, more easier to navigate, um, catchier. Um, we can still have the traditional meets that, that can still happen, but there's got to be a way to capture. Maybe you invite, maybe you look at the, maybe you look at, okay. So you, you, you look at an AFL competition like the amateurs, 
and you have a special event where you invite every club nominates their, their, their quickest person over 400 metres or 800 or 100, whatever it is, and you have an Athletics Victoria or Athletics Australia sponsored event where you actually find out who is the fastest amateur or local mm. footballer in Australia. And then you talk to them about maybe trying to, you know, you're not going to make it a footy. This, I don't know, stuff like that. I think yeah. we could, Just I don't know, maybe they're already do that. I don't know. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, Sorry, oh, I'm a bit, I'm a bit no, heated about that. <laughs> that's good. And I love your official story because long time listeners of the show will know I shared this story a couple, maybe 2020. I was in the call room of the Australian 5K Championships. I don't know how I got in there. I think I was the worst guy in the best race. And um, <laughs> Stewie was in there just minding his own business, sitting down on the seat, and he likes to put his numbers, six them onto his legs, yeah. um, which he does in every Diamond League, every Olympic final, every World Championship race, whatever he's doing. But in Victoria, you need to use four pins and stick them on your actual shorts, both sides. And the official was absolutely ripping him to shreds. Like, you will not be racing if they're not on the shorts properly. And he's just like head down. He just wanted to say so relaxed. And it just reminded me of being in about grade four and the deputy principal yeah. or principal just ripping a kid to um, pieces for not behaving properly. And I'm just like, this is the greatest runner we could potentially have as a distance runner. And um, this is how we're treating him. And she was probably just a volunteer, just, just doing her job. This is black yep. and white. This is where you put the stickers. But yeah. yeah, need some kind of like flexibility there, I'm sure. T- totally, totally. Hey, um, talk to me about flow state. I'm pretty sure your second book, there was a chapter on it. So you've kind of, um, when I read that, actually I listened to it as, as an audio book and I remember listening to that chapter being like, this is distance runners. We spend more time in flow state, I think, than um, so many more people, you know, depending, because just because just we don't have many distractions in yeah. our races, we don't have to do much. We just kind of like run in a straight line for 42K or 21K or whatever yeah. race you're doing. And I, this yeah. really resonated with me. And obviously you've done the research and been able to compose a chapter on it. But um, what did you learn? What are kind of the takeaways if people haven't heard about flow state before? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who this will um, connect with. It's it's flow state is what got me through COVID, the, the really the, the lockdowns. Flow is the activity that you're doing that you love so much and also you're really good at. You have a natural aptitude towards it that when you're doing it, it's like time sort of no longer exists. Mm-hmm. Someone could stop you and say, how long have you been doing this for? And you'd go, I don't know. I have no idea. This is, I'm not sure. You would say something like, I don't know, five minutes. Turns out it's been 25 minutes. Um, if someone stopped you in this while you're doing this activity and said, what are you thinking about? Your answer would probably be, I'm actually not even thinking. This is just happening. Um, for a lot of people, it, it could be playing music. For some people, it could be gardening. Other people, it could be, um, for me, it's a, it's a very weird one for me. There's two options, but two examples. One is public speaking. I just love it so much that I just get, you know, I just get lost in it and it just happens. Um, uh, the other one for me is running. Um, but as a lot of listeners will have the same thing. And it is, research is is saying, it is one of the greatest things you can do for your mental health is to spend time in flow. The problem is we spend a lot of time in flow as kids growing up because we just do the activity we love, whether it's skateboarding or whether it's being in a band or or whatever it is, we just, we have time to do that. We make time for it. It's like our, it's our hobby. We all participate in our hobby. Then when we reach adulthood, we kind of park it for a bit and go, well, I don't have time for that. I've got to get the kids here. I've got to study this or I've got to get to work and we stop participating in flow. It's one of the greatest things you can do for your mental health is to spend time doing something that you're really good at, that you love so much that your brain just sort of stops thinking because you're so in it. And middle distance running, I don't say this in most of the podcasts I do because most people listening won't get it, but I, I feel like I don't do middle distance anymore. But when I was, even when I was first training for 400, I didn't know how I was meant to train. I'd do two longer runs. When I say long for me, it might be a 10K and a 5K a week. It's just, it's like, give me probably five or 10 minutes and then I'm on. And it's just like, you can feel it. It's just like every, all the worries of the world just dis- disappear and there's nothing happening before you know it, your run's finished. Um, and you realize you haven't really thought about much. It's just kind of, it's just been happening. And I think the more time we spend in flow, the better we're off, the better off we are emotionally um, and mentally. Yeah. And I think like the cut and some of the use of technology within running as well. Like often I've had, I've had ran two PBs this year and both the times I stuffed up my watch. So I, I, I'm a kind of operator that likes to know my splits, likes to know what's happening. And I just, yeah, didn't push the right button twice, but I found myself in a race where it's like, you don't have any, 
external factors here telling you how you're going. So just pretty much run as hard as you can. And both times I got to the finish line, I was like, shit, that's way quicker than I've ever gone before. And I put this down to similar stuff that you're saying because I didn't have a watch to look down at every three minutes when it beeped. I could just be like, okay, this is just just enter it and run hard. It's fascinating, isn't it? I, I, I actually, on that very topic, I got Strava and I had it for two weeks and I just yeah. had to get rid of it because I was running for the wrong reason. It was all about external validation. Anything you do for external validation in life is going to make you miserable. Everything needs to be about internal validation. So you're doing it for yourself. So say, for example, if the reason you run is to make your dad happy because he was a runner and he just wants you to run, you're doing it to make him happy. That's not the right reason. But if you run for the feeling you get when you're running fast, when you when you, you know, doing doing a good time or just when you're in it, that that's what's going to make you happy. And I found that with Strava, I was just comparing myself to everyone all the bloody time. And then I would, I couldn't, I couldn't do a recovery run because I'd be doing it in like five minute Ks. I'm like, this is embarrassing. I can't do this. I got it. I got it. So I'd go, it wouldn't Pick be a recovery run. I'm pushing myself too hard because <laughs> people were going to see it. I was like, I can't, I can't have people thinking that's a real, I'm just really slow. And then on a rest day, I'd see someone I was a bit competitive with running. I'm like, oh, I got to, I got to go and do it. And I get injured. So um, on the topic of running for mental health, if, if Strava works for you, go for it. If it's, if it's your motivation, keeps you, keeps you motivated, then go for it. But I, for me, it was just, it caused more stress than it was worth. It really did. And and I reckon running without your watch, just going for a run without your watch every now and again, so you properly disconnect from everything. I think. I mean, it's hard because we're so trained to just everything needs to be in the Garmin. But I heard Stewie tell a story. I think it was on. I think it was on your podcast. Stewie talked yeah. about how he, he doesn't he doesn't take his he doesn't have Strava or he doesn't even he use his watch. Watch. Yeah. Yeah, as a stopwatch instead. Um, which I when he said that. I was like, well, I, you need to. That needs to be clipped up and sent to every runner because I think it's 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 forcing us to run for the wrong reason. Yeah, I often enjoy going out and back for that reason as well, so I don't have to think for the second half yeah. of it. So if I've got an yeah. hour, I just you know you know find somewhere scenic or in the bush and half an hour, and then I can just switch off the mind because I've just got to follow my footsteps on the way back. And um, yeah, I think that's another. And and it brings me to the next point. I listened to your podcast last week and the whole connection to country you had um paul callahan on yeah. and i was just like where as runners we're doing this a shitload too like we are out in the bush you look at the guys who go to fernie every week like they don't probably know it or or spin it and talk about it that way but that's what he's talking about and that's what i think a lot of distance runners and people that do the sport um also do like just get out in the bush and and yeah just go to environments that a lot of the general population don't get to go to yeah, so Dr. Paul Gallagher, who's an Indigenous man who was on our podcast, he was brilliant. And, and as you said, he just said that one of the keys in Indigenous mental health, well, I don't know they call it mental health, but just wellbeing, is mm. is being connected to the outdoors, really, and, and trees and the, and the dirt on the ground and, and the water and all that kind of stuff that, that come with going out to country and going out bush. And you're so right. Like we, there's this run, I train at Clifton Hill um, in Melbourne, there's a uh, Collingwood Harriers Club. Yep. And there's a creek that runs along. I might have been the. Is know, it the Mary Co- Creek? Is it the Mary, Mary Creek? Yeah, Mary yeah. Creek. You're right. Mary Creek. Um, and there's this path that goes along there, and you find yourself after about five minutes, you you, you move away from the roads, and you're on a dirt track, and you are cut. There's just gum trees, just like everywhere. You're surrounded by the gum trees. You have lights that are streaming through the trees. You can hear the trickling of the water. At Mary Creek. Um, you hear birds, a lot of birds, and you just feel very connected to outdoors and to nature. And the research and the science says that is unbelievably good for your mental health. But there's also an element of one of the other things that's really good for mental health is awe, being surrounded by things that that remind you that you are really just a small thing in a very big piece of, the, you know, there's like huge trees or, you know, the river or just seeing things that like in nature that amaze you, it's really good for you. It's like ocean swimming is really good for you for that reason. You're reminded of how small and insignificant you really are. And I think, I think middle distance runners and long distance runners, I think that's one of the things if when they, when they get injured and they start doing rehab or in a gym and are on a bike, I think, yeah. that, I, think I, I think that's the, one of the things that you probably don't realize, but that's one of the things you're really missing is a connection to outdoors and to nature. Yeah. Well, let's take it back to you though, mate, because I want to get into your um your shoes. Moose told yes. tells me that you slide into his DMs a bit at the running company. I think it was when he was at the running company Ballarat. Not sure if you purchased anything off him at the running company Geelong now. I went through your Instagram, saw a picture of you holding a pair of uh next percent, I think they were, 
after you'd been kicked out of swimming nice. in a um, hotel <laughs> lobby pond, not the actual swimming pool. And then I saw another <laughs> pair where you were wearing, I think you wore the dragonflies, the Nike dragonflies over 400 metres uh, when you won that Vic Masters title. Both of those surprised me because the dragonfly is kind of a middle distance um, yep. spike and the next percenters are like, they're 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 kind of 5K up kind of shit. I'm not sure what you're doing in the next percenters, but tell me and then <laughs> and then tell me what else you're wearing. Okay, so collection. Okay, can I actually take you back to my shoe story? Because I, I, I am I am obsessed with shoes, running shoes. I always have been. As a kid at primary school, when we're all sitting on the carpet and the teacher's reading a book, I just looked at everyone's shoes. That's just I just really? I always yeah, just okay. love running shoes. I used to draw airbags on my I had the the first like running shoes that mum and dad got me. Well, I had Dunlop volleys, like everyone had Dunlop volleys back in the eighties. But I had a pair of um uh for cross uh, New Balance nine nine fives, I think they were, like the original, their first like iteration of a running shoe. And with a pen I drew airbags on them, like and because <laughs> I was like that obsessed with already. I wanted to have my airbags, but uh because I wanted Air Max, that's what mum and dad are like, you're not getting Air Max, they're way too expensive. But my first ever pair of sprinting shoes, this is an amazing story. So grade three is when you start doing athletics, I think in primary schools. And if you win the school meet, you get to go to the district. And I won the school one, then I got doing the 200. I got to go to the district. And I was very surprised, I was very surprised when I about winning that. And then I went to zone, which felt like the world championships, but I ended up sneaking home and winning that as well. And dad was so excited because I had to go, then I go to state champions, state championships. And I, dad goes, I think you need a pair of spikes. He said, we're going to get you a pair of running spikes. And I couldn't believe Ooh. it. So dad calls a mate of his, um, who was also a parent at the school, Bill Hooker, former um, Australian 800 metre um, champion um, from the, he, was, he ran the Commonwealth Games. And dad said to Bill Hooker, um, Hugh's going to the state championships um, in a couple of weeks. Where do we get spikes? And Bill said, you don't need to spend much, he said, you don't, spend, you don't need to spend much money. There's, a, there's an op shop near where we live in Bourne. And they've always got this basket full of like old shoes. We'll find some there for him. And he said, I'll bring my son along. He'll love this as well. So Steve Hooker came along as well. So my first ever, I got my first ever pair of spikes. They were a pair of orange and black tigers, like leather, like proper leather. <laughs> Somehow they're a bit too big for me. But Steve Hooker was there with me. He was two years below me at school. This is gold medalist, uh, pole vaulter Steve Hooker for people that yeah, yeah. Yeah, might not be sure yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve Hooker, Australian gold medalist. Um, he's there with me and we're, we're choosing my spikes and we're both so excited. He, he was too young. He's in grade one at the time, but his dad was like, in a couple of years, mate, you can, you can get a pair, but right now we're getting these for Hugh and Steve was so excited. And, and there was this secondhand old pair of leather running spikes. And I just, I, I slept them in my bed that night. Dad took them out. He's like, mate, you'll roll over and hurt yourself. You'll roll on yeah. those spikes. It's not like a cricket bat. You can't Rip do all your sheets up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then from there, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I didn't do very well at the state championships. I, in fact, I did quite poorly. But um, yeah, from then I, just, I, I sort of lost interest in running shoes. Right, I, I wore when I left school. It was always Asics Kayanos. There was I don't know why. That's just what I wore all the time. Oh, they're the most expensive pair on the wall. So when you go in there, that's the one you buy because you think the the cost is they're going to help you the most as a runner. I did the same yeah, when but, I started. Moose loves that story. Yeah, well, that, that's what you do, isn't it? I yeah. was like, well, this this is going to make me the fastest. Surely that should be what it is. Two hundred and sixty bucks. Better buy those ones. Yeah, exactly. And so, but they never, um, but then when I got back into running, I was like, I, I, um, I, I had a, um, I've got a thing now, developed a thing. I, I bought a pair of Nike, an old pair of Nike spikes. This is like three or four years ago. I can't remember what they were, but they rubbed them. I've got a, um, Hagland, uh, oh, yep. deformity. On, on the called. heel Achilles. Yep. Yeah. Which is like a, for everyone listening, it's like a little, um, bone spur or like a, burst that pops out the back of the, the only way to get rid of it is to have it surgically operated and mm. they have to take your they have it to, off don't they they shove but before they shove it off they have to um detach your achilles, achilles tendon from yeah. your heel that's so ruined a, a lot month. of distance runners over the years yeah it has it really okay mm. that's yep. that's really interesting because i i was like when i heard that i was like i'm not doing that i am not doing that yeah. i'm just going to try and manage it but it means i'm limited with the shoes i can wear so the shoe that i wear now mainly for running I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, and everyone's going to go, what do you, in fact, I've had this conversation with Chicken at the running company because he cannot believe. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I I can only really wear the Adidas Ultra Boost Climber, which the like the stability in those things, I can barely go around the corner without falling over. There's just no stability whatsoever, but they've got a really soft heel counter. So I just have to wear things that are really soft heel counter and they tend to have the softest heel counter possible. 
uh, for me anyway. Um, so I've got like four pairs of those because I keep wearing those out. Um, I did find that the PEG 37s were really good um, until I put on the Ultra Boost and realized they were just heaps better. Um, so, but, I like, but for me, I don't really do many long runs. For me, it's a warm up and a cool down basically up before sprint training. So it's not as important. And I got the, um, yeah, I bought the Vaporfly because I just, I just had to experience them. I just like the stories I've heard about them. I just had to, I had just had to try them. And I, I, I've worn them. I, I love them oh, so much. They're cheating. Like I just cannot believe how much quicker I am when I wear those things. But the only problem is when I take them off and then I get into my yeah. spikes, I don't feel as quick. It, I feel slow. It's bad. Yeah. 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 And that's a, that's a bad feeling before you race a sprint to feel slower than what <laughs> you're currently wearing. So I've sort of, I, I, in fact, I've got a, I've got them right here. You can see they're very white. I haven't worn them yep. that much just because I don't feel good up. Anyway, the reason I wear the dragonflies for the 400s to answer your question is you know how they've got the hole in the back of the shoe? Yep. There's that hole. The hag gland pokes perfectly through the back. <laughs> is Perfect. that a I good thought, thing? Yeah, because <laughs> it, it's small enough that it doesn't rub. It fits okay. perfectly through the back. And also... When I wore a sprinting spike, my Achilles just blow up the next mm -hmm. day massive and I can't walk downstairs and I'm in agony. Whereas these, um, the first time I went to buy spikes from, um, I went to Runner's World um, and there was a girl, she would have been 19 or 20 serving me. And I said, hi, I'm just starting sprinting again. I'm 38 years old. I'd like some sprinting spike, please. <laughs> and she goes, uh, and I saw these unreal looking Nike ones, like proper 100 meter sprinting ones. And I said, what about these? And she goes, how old are you? And I said, I'm 38. And she goes, I think we might start you in something like this. And she pulled out these things with a massive heel on them. <laughs> they didn't look anywhere near as cool. But I, and I ignored her and got the sprinting ones, but my Achilles blew up so quickly. And I've just found for me that the Ultra Boost, they're not a great sprinting spike, but I can train them and I don't get sore. My heel pokes out the back. Chicken from the, um, from the running company sent me, and I keep plugging him because he's very good to me, Chicken. He sent me a pair of, um, uh, the, I wrote them down um their air zoom max fly and they feel unreal i think they're like more of a 400 800 shoe they feel unreal but it's a pretty hard heel counter so that's an issue for me at the moment and this morning um, i purchased the um air zoom victory which has the bags at the front um and the a 1500 meter kind of one would that be yeah the, yeah the guy said mate this is an 800 1500 he said it's 800 to 3000 and I said, yeah, I know, but it's, 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 it looks like a quicker shoe than the, than the dragonfly. So I think I'm going to give this a burst. Um, so oh. who knows? I'm going to try them tomorrow. Sub 52. Here we come this summer. Well, I have, feel like. I, <laughs> have you set I, some goals? Yeah. I have this ridiculous aim, which every time I, I have an aim, which I'm embarrassed to admit because people just laugh at it, but the national record for men's 40 to 45 is 49.89. I think it is. Who's got and, it? Do you know the name? Uh, Sorry, I'll put you on the spot here. No, no, no. I've forgotten his name. Um, I reckon it's a really old record. I think it's a really old record. Um, in fact, I think it's like in the 90s or 80s or something like that. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, to me, that is just – because when I ran the 52 second, I felt really good after it. And I felt like I had more – and so at, at age 42, I feel like, because I'm new to the sport, I feel like there might be something I'm doing that's just really wrong that someone could see and go, oh, you're doing that. If you just try that, and then all of a sudden I'll drop two seconds off my, off my time. I don't know. It's probably, I'll probably, ne I'll probably never get close to 52 one again, but I, um, that's kind of, I'd, too, I'd, 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 love to, I'd love to get quicker than 52 one. I'd love to do that. If get into the 50 ones. What, what, I, don't know if the, I, don't know if, I don't know if I'm the one who does this. I think it might be a cricket thing. When you play cricket, you exaggerate your average. You always round up. So I actually ran a 52.19, but when people ask me, I go, yeah, it was a 52.1. <laughs> yeah. um, and oh. when it was, so I don't know if I'm the only one who does that, but I'm very good at rounding down. My marathon PB is 2 hours 19.53, but I never say the seconds. I'm like a 2 hours 19 guy. Like, although I was only seven <laughs> seconds off being a 2.20 guy, I'm a 2 19 <laughs> guy, and no one cares about the seconds in a marathon. <laughs> just got under by the way that is unbelievably fast how long ago was that uh that was in berlin in 2018 and you're probably the only person that thinks it's fast because the other two boys are two hours 14 and two hours 17 so they give me shit about it all the time about being so much slower than them but um yeah, yeah. two two minutes slower in a marathon that's not that it's much slower thanks you i'll pass that on to the boys but yeah i know <laughs> i know but even that goal setting thing i think 
we're wired interesting in running where we're never quite happy. Like it's, yeah, I had, yeah, yeah. That's an issue. Yeah. You notice that as well? Like I always thought breaking 30 minutes for 10K was the thing. And then you break it and you're like, oh, I just feel exactly the same. Like your life does not change at all. Yeah, every every day of my life when I'm I do a talk and I talk about a thing called the if and then model of happiness, which is where we say to ourselves, mm. you know, if I buy this car, then I feel happy. If I buy this house, then I feel happy. And inevitably, you buy the house, feels good for, but then you just wish you had a better house. R- nothing has blown that up. There's nothing more. I, I've managed to do a lot of work to to not be affected by that, like car, house, job, salary. I'm like, do you know what? I've got good stuff in my life, but I cannot get past this with running. I cannot. Um, last season I was injured for my hammies are useless and I only got to race three times and I I raced the last race of the season I hadn't raced in three months and I ran a 53, 53 seconds flat which is the second fastest time I've ever run and I was really flat about myself I was really down on myself I was like oh it's not a 52 one and then I'm like of course it's not like you're 42 years old you haven't raced in three months like it took me a long time to be happy with that because it wasn't the fastest I've ever run. And I, I have noticed that with runners a lot. You know, I'll chat to, I trained with um, Kevin Rasul, who's a 56.5, 400 meter runner. Like he's seriously fast. 46. Well, yeah, 46. Did just, I say 56? Just ripped him oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, just made him slower than you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> Kev is a lot quicker. Kev, um, <laughs> Kev is one of the best human beings I've met in my life and I've met him through running. But 40... There are so many great human beings in the in the running community. It's I've been very blessed to meet a lot of them. But forty six point five, and he he raced. He hadn't raced in a while because he got chronic fatigue, and he raced and he was so shattered because he ran a forty seven point seven, I think it was, and he was devastated. And I was looking at him going, "Mate, if I could run forty seven point seven, I would be the happiest man alive." But I know if I somehow magically got down to that, I'd be going, "Well, if I can get under forty seven point five, and I think." all runners need to get back to the reason that we run and it's for the love of it. Like I love the feeling of running fast. That's what it is. At the end of the race, I can get a 53 second and go, I should be reflecting on the fact that I'm 42 years old and I'm running. That's a win. Like that is a win for me. I just, I'm so lucky to be doing that. Um, And I think it's something I have noticed in running. We're very good at, we're so good at paying attention to the negatives. We're so good at paying attention to things that don't like, there's so much to celebrate about running, but we rarely stop and do that. Yeah, I agree. And I think the whole social media stuff probably doesn't make it easier as well. Like just, yeah, makes it makes it bigger. And uh, that grass is always greener on the other side, kind of saying kind of when you look out to oh, it. Totally. And I'm sure it must be so like, you know, I'm not elite. I must, I'm must. i imagining for elite runners and people who run marathons as fast as you guys do, it must be even more so when the amount of time and effort you put in and the amount of thought and everything I really think it must be a whole new level of like, I've got a, sorry, my phone keeps beeping here. Sorry. Um, I, it must be a whole new level of that, you know, compare and despair. You know, you look at someone you train with your entire life, all of a sudden has got a lot quicker and you, you can't help but go, why aren't I doing that? Rather mm-hmm. than just going, I love that person. I'm so happy for them. That's how we should be, but such a competitive environment. Yeah, it is. Hey, Hugh, I haven't got much longer with you, but I've got some quick fire questions for you. If you're happy to yes. take them. Go for it. Favorite workout. And why? My favorite at the moment is a session uh, I'm doing, which I actually learned through um, Feed the Cats. Uh, oh, yeah. I, wish, I wish I could remember that guy's name for you. Sorry. But if people That's look right, up Feed the it. Cats, sprint it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, he's got all these lectures online. We'll put in my the favorite session, Yeah, my favorite session is three by 300s with a 10-minute rest in between. So for middle distance runners, it sounds a bit like, that's ridiculous. Why are you resting for so long? Nah, we get it though. Speed kills. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So I saw him do that with his athletes that session and they looked so unwell afterwards. I was like, I've got to try that. And I did the first one. I did it in 40 seconds, the first 300 I did it in. And then the next one I did 40 again. And with the last 20 meters, I felt as sick as I've felt in a long time. And I was with Kevin Rousseau at the time. And he said, I don't know if there's any point doing the third one. He said, I just feel like the quality is going to be pretty poor. You're going to do it in probably 43, 44. Let's just do a 150 to finish and let's try and do it in, you know, 18 seconds or whatever, whatever he said. I can't remember what he said, mate, 18, 19 seconds. And I said, I just want to see what this feels like. So we did the third one and I think I did it in 41 seconds. 
I I didn't do another session for another three days because I didn't feel like I needed to. Like I felt like my body was recovering for three days. It's like a proper lactate session and it was so brutal. But the impact it had on me, the next time I stood up to do a 400, I felt like this is nothing. I did three mm -hmm. 300s like, you're right, speed kills. It really, it's just, it's 900 meters total. That's it. But my God, full on. So that's probably my favorite. Yep. I'll le let you do uh, three athletes for this one, but we'll leave Kat Bissett out because she's the easy one. I think everyone would expect you to say her number one, but three could be Australian, could be international athletes that are like super inspirational for you. You look up to, you like how they operate. Who comes to mind? Of course, Cat's uh, there, but give me three more. Uh, I love um, Stewie McSwaney for the way the way I love Stewie for the way he goes about it. Like that, his this reckless confidence that he has. Um, he doesn't necessarily. He, he lets his running to the talking first of all, and he yeah, just true. throws him. He throws himself into winning positions, which I just love so much, and I admire so much because it takes. I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, so I love him. Um, Nina Kennedy. I'm a huge fan of Nina Kennedy, the pole vaulter. Um, Goes under the radar being from WA too, I find. Totally, totally. Mm. And I just reckon there's, I reckon, I don't know, I reckon there's a story there as well. I don't know what it is, but, but the the the, um, the fierce competitive nature that sort of tends to bring the best out of her. And there's some athletes that you can, you see on centre stage, you can see it, it almost a little bit too much. It happens to athletes all the time. It happens to me as well sometimes in my 400s when no one's watching. I feel a bit overwhelmed by it and get too nervous. But I love watching her com I love watching her compete. I, I love watching when it gets – when the going gets tough, you can see her going, oh, I'm on here. And I love this. She looks like she loves the competition, so yeah. I, I do love that. But it seems like she's so chilled when she's not competing. Like the contrast between on and off for her seems like just different ends of the scale. And I've only seen her on TV kind of thing, don't know anything about her. But you just, yeah, she strikes me as someone who's very relaxed and then goes to very competitive very quickly. Yeah, and I think you've summarised that perfectly. And I think that's why it's so obvious the, the competitive nature of it because when she's not competing, like you said, she's just like anyone just going about her business, just so down to earth. And so, yeah, yeah. so love, love Nina. She's, um, I, I can't believe how, how she, she should be having a much bigger profile than she does. I don't know. I think maybe because she's in Perth, that she's training in Perth. I don't know, but... I mean, yeah, the World Championships followed by Commonwealth Games is unbelievable. Um, I love um, Del Santos, the 400, four by 400 meter hurdle. I love him. I just something. Um, Got an I mean, interesting story as well, doesn't it? Like, did he have yeah. the, the burns? Like, yeah, was that that's yeah. him? Boiling water. I think it was boiling yeah. water when he was a kid, tipped all over his head. And, yeah. Um, horrific scars. But just watching him move is pretty special. Uh, you've asked for three and I'm going to give you four. As far as watching an athlete, Peter Bowl, I I could just watch him. I mean, I did the other day. He was at Collingwood when I was training um, and I'd finished my session and I was late to get back to work, but I just sat and watched him train. I watched him train for like an hour and I tried to talk to him. He walked past me and I, and I was like, oh, I'm going to chat to him here. And I went, g'day, mate. I thought he'd finish. I went, g'day, mate. And he goes, how you going? And just kept walking. <laughs> he walked straight past me. I was like, yeah, I'll just pretend I was going to walk a lap anyway. <laughs> You, um, uh, yeah. Bendiria Boya, have you seen her getting around that group as well? She's yeah, a very I've seen smooth her. operator, yeah. She's she got is, a good yeah. documentary out at the moment as well on SBS. About yeah, I've been, it's yeah. on my, um, I've got a lot of travel coming up for my shows that I'm doing around the country and I've got it in my head as something to watch on the plane. I, I yeah, I don't know her too well. I, I haven't seen much of her around, but I, incredible story as well. But, yeah. um, but I, I know you know, I'm not allowed to say Katrina, but Katrina, Katrina's not only one of the best, like, one of the best athletes I've ever seen. She's also one of the best people I've ever met and, and inspires me every single day just to be better as a person, really. She's just a beauty. We'll link in her episode with you in our show notes as well because I think people find it fascinating if they haven't already listened to it to then hear how you've spoken about it today, to then go back to hearing yeah. the interview before all this kind of kicked off. And then the final one I often ask people is uh, what's on the bedside table? What book are you reading at the moment? Got something on the go? Oh, good question. Um, oh, um, um, What's it called? Jeez, it must be like good. The... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get the name wrong. It's like Run Like the Kenyans or Running with the Kenyans. Running with the Kenyans, yeah. Yeah, really yeah. Cool. I hadn't read it. I, I, I read it. I started reading it many months, uh, many years ago, and then I've just picked it up. Well, it was like two years ago, and I've started. I picked it up, and I'm getting into it again. It's not relevant to me because it's all about long distance, like marathon running. But I'm just, I'm just finding that fascinating. Um, I've read also. 
um, oh, my, my memory for names is so bad. Um, Ralph Dubell's book, Ralph Dubell, the 800 yeah. meter runner. I've read yeah. that is a ripping book. Have you read uh, Peter Norman's? Surely. Yes, I've read, I've, Peter, I've read yep. Peter Norman's as well. Yep. Um, yep. And learning about Tams and Lewis's dad around that time as well, which has really been fascinating. Yeah. Um, but um, at the moment that, and I'm reading, it's a bit boring for runners, but I'm reading about stoicism a lot at the moment. So, oh, yeah, uh, Ryan ancient, Holiday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been into that as well. So, yeah, it's been, it's all really fascinating stuff. But, um, yeah, that's, I, I do love running books. I wish there were more. I don't know if anyone's mm. got recommendations for sprinters books. I haven't, I don't think there are many sprinting books out there that I'm aware of that are any good, but, um, yeah, if anyone yeah. knows, if they could, um, when this is, when this is, when this episode goes up, if people could comment on the Instagram page of any good sprinting yeah. books I know, that'd be great. Let's see how we go. Peter Norman's son actually lives in Echuca, where I'm from, and there's one bloody Strava segment I can't get over like 100 metres. He's obviously got that natural speed from Peter, oh. and I've had that many cracks at it. And um, <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he probably said it five or six years ago, and it's just sat there, and everyone has a go at it, and no one can get it. So um Oh, yeah, what a legend. Got that like connection father, like son. Yeah. Like father, like son. That's yep. so good. Hey, Hugh, thanks so much for your time. Um, that hour went super fast. I think we're in a bit of flow state there because uh, totally. time time totally got away from us there. And uh, thanks for, yeah, all you do and all the other aspects of your life and putting all that good content out there. And, um, yeah, I couldn't recommend more listeners for Hugh's books and Hugh's podcast. And if you have an opportunity to go see him speak, definitely take it. So, um, and thanks for being in the running circles and a fan of running to kind of help our sport grow and promote it. If anyone sees me out running, stop and say hi. I love chatting to other runners and hearing their story. I think I see them all the time around the track and the, um, yeah, I just love it. It's a great community you're part of. And thanks for having me. I, there are two podcasts I listen to religious, uh, religiously, Hamish and Andy and Inside Running Podcast. They're my two. So to be on this is like the girls outside the office here were like, I was, I was doing a few notes and I said, what are you doing? I said, oh, got a podcast coming up and they said you have never taken notes before and i went yeah i really want to do well with this one." <laughs> oh, that's good we had a staff meeting last night we didn't have a staff meeting we spoke off air last night and the boys are like what are you going to ask him and i'm just like oh, i just want to ask him stuff so much about running because i know you speak about so many other i didn't want you just to have to spit out all the resilience project kind of stuff no, I'm sick again of it. I'm sick so of it. thank you yeah thank you. it was um good just to talk mainly run stuff today and yeah appreciate your honesty and stuff all right legend thanks so much This episode of the Inside Running Podcast is brought to you by Pillar Performance, Australia's leading sports micronutrition brand, providing high strength in form sport certified formulations to support recovery, boost immunity, and relieve joint inflammation for endurance athletes. Available online now at pillarperformance.shop. i